Officially, yesterday was the first day of spring. But for the Red Sox and the Cardinals, their rebirth began in late February here in Florida. Boston has questions to answer. But with a dynamic young core in place, they have designs on returning to the top of the AL East. St. Louis has won the NL Central three straight years. Do they have the pieces to make it four in a row? The Red Sox and Cardinals square off next from Roger Dean Stadium in Jupiter, Florida. Welcome to Spring Training Baseball on ESPN, presented by Head and & Shoulders. And welcome to a nice but very windy day here in Florida. We're in Jupiter, the spring training home of the St. Louis Cardinals, with the Boston Red Sox in town this afternoon. Hi, everybody. Dan Schulman, Jessica Mendoza, Aaron Boone. Glad you're along with us this afternoon. The Cardinals, year after year, are a contending team. And year after year, they seem to have a couple of young players who make their way to the majors and do well. And two of those young players are going to be asked just to step into even larger roles this season. They are. And that's Stephen Piscotty and Randall Gritchick. They are the future of the Cardinals. And not just for what they do defensively, but what they provide offensively. And they do it in very different ways. Think about Stephen Piscotty. His swing is one of the smoothest and most beautiful in all of baseball. And what he's able to do consistently, batting over 300, still trying to work a little bit more on the power. But that's where you have on the reverse another new guy in Randall Gritchick. And this is a guy who has so much pop. His power numbers, but what he's trying to get to is be a little bit more consistent. They balance each other out very well, and they're going to provide a big boost in this Cardinals offense. Meanwhile, for the Red Sox, they finished last for the second consecutive year last year, Aaron, but they think going into this season, they can contend. They've made a lot of changes. Of course, David Price, Craig Kimbrell are now Red Sox, but as we focus on a couple of Boston players, they really need some veteran guys to do better this year than they did last year. They do, Dan, and the American League East is wide open this year, and the Red Sox have all kind of question marks, but they have tremendous upside. And two of those question marks will be on display today. Pablo Sandoval, who finds himself in a position battle at third base with the upstart Travis Shaw, who burst on the season a year ago. Pablo will DH today. Across the diamond, Hanley Ramirez, who battled through injuries, struggled defensively in left field, is making a position switch across the diamond. He's having a lot of fun. And for more on how that position switch is going, let's send it down to Buster only. Buster? Yeah, Aaron, the Red Sox have questions, but they have at least one answer. Hanley Ramirez looks good playing defensively at first base. He looks comfortable. Yes, he's got things to learn, like how to dig throws out of the dirt, where to set up on relays. But infield coach Brian Butterfield told me that he feels like Hanley is reinvesting the idea of defense since moving back to the infield after that tough 2015 in the outfield. When I asked Hanley about it, he said he loves playing first base. Dan, it's back to you. All right, Buster, thank you. Another guy the Red Sox need a big season from is on the mound this afternoon. Clay Buckholz, can he stay healthy and be that number two starter in the rotation for Boston? Red Sox, Cardinals coming up.
Florida. Dan Schulman, Aaron Boone, Jessica Mendoza, Buster Olney. Glad you're with us. we got some spring training action coming your way from Roger Dean Stadium. The Boston Red Sox have come across the state for three days, actually, including a stop here in Jupiter where they take on the Cardinals today. Let's take a look now at the Red Sox lineup. And we talked about some veteran guys at Sandoval, Ramirez, and just some of the younger players really coming into their own. Yeah, starting off with one of your best, Mookie Betts. He's going to have an MVP-type season, so versatile. He can hit it out. Lay it down, run it out. And Bogarts in that third spot. He's second last year in batting in the AL, second in hits, batted 320, and he's going to boost those power numbers. A lot of regulars in there for the Red Sox today. No Ortiz, no Pedroia, but just about everybody else on the mound today for the Cardinals left hander Marco Gonzalez. Yeah, a lot of talent. The first round pick in 2013. 2015 was a bit of a lost season because of shoulder issues. They have high expectations for Gonzalez at this point. Probably starts the season in the minor leagues, but definitely probably the sixth starter right now, tapping into some of that depth. Pitched very well out of the bullpen a couple of years ago for the Cardinals. Pitched in relief in the postseason as well. Good thing this is a baseball game and not hockey, football, or basketball. Everybody's wearing red today. Don't the teams talk about these sorts of things, Aaron? I mean, what's what's going on here? We got a memo. We're wearing red. Yeah, we're wearing red too. Here's Mookie Betts. You saw the numbers from a year ago. 291, 18 homers, 42 doubles, 8 triples. You name it, he did it. Is going to be the everyday right fielder at least right now. The Red Sox still trying to figure things out if they ever had to move him back to center. If Jackie Bradley didn't hit, Betts could move back to center. But right now, it looks like the outfield would be Castillo in left, Bradley in center, and Betts in right. And Gonzalez is in with the strike one and two. Although there's a guy we're going to talk about a lot today, Travis Shaw who could figure into things for the Red Sox at first, third, or maybe even in left field. <laughs> Off the end of the bat into right center field for out number one. Second base for number 12, Black This telecast of spring training baseball on ESPN is presented by Head & Shoulders. Live head first. And in part by H&R Block. It's refund season. Visit hrblock.com today. Brock Holt, the batter now for the Red Sox. He started ah! second of base today. Anybody who follows the Red Sox on any level knows how versatile Holt is. He made a start at seven different positions last year. Second base more often than anywhere else and figures to have the same kind of role oh, this year. Broken to back ground ball. Backhand stopped by Gonzalez. Most of the bat out between first and second. Well, watching Gonzalez here, you know, dealing with that shoulder injury, the first thing I look for is does he look healthy? And the answer to these first two hitters is absolutely yes, as he blows up Brock Holt on the inside part of the plate there. Just a crispness to his fastball that's typically going to be around 89 90. Real good straight change. That third development of a breaking ball for him that continued to work on that will be a key for him in developing as a key starter down the road for the Cardinals. Because of the shoulder issues, just one major league appearance a year ago, made 18 starts at various levels of the minors. Sander Bogart steps in and he takes inside for ball one. Bogarts, like Betts, a terrific year last year, hit 320, drove in 81, 35 doubles. You know, both of these teams have kind of an interesting mix, guys, of players in their mid and in some cases upper 30s and then a real good young wave of players coming into their own as well. What's that perfect ideal balance too when you talk about Big Poppy, David Ortiz and Dustin Pedroia, really the leaders and the, the faces of this franchise for so long and now up and coming Xander Bogarts, Mookie Betts and they work so well together playing off each other, learning, just even talking before the game to Bogarts about how he's been Picking the brain of Dustin Pedroia. He goes out early, hits with him. That kind of stuff is what you want to see. Ranging to his right, Big Matt Adams feeds Gonzalez covering. And three up, three down. Go the Red Sox in the top of the first. Cardinals coming up against Clay Buckholz when we come back.
final score between the Red Sox and the Cardinals. And uh, time now to take a look at the Cardinal lineup. And as is the case with the Red Sox, maybe even more so because they're home. A lot of the regulars are in the lineup today for St. Louis. Well, Matt Carpenter at the stop, one of the premier leadoff hitters in the game, set career highs in homers and RBIs. I think he might even be able to expect those to go up this year. That's just kind of the track he's been on early in his career. And Matt Holiday, 279 last season in an injury-riddled season. He is key to the middle of this lineup. And on the mound, Jess, for the Red Sox today, a guy, I mean, he can be great. He can really struggle. He can be healthy. He can be hurt. You just don't know. Well, and I think the Red Sox are counting on him. Obviously, his health first and foremost. But when he's healthy, I think he slides in into that two spot behind David Price, a the spot they're really looking at because he has such a great arsenal to bust platoons. Nice cutter against righties. He's working on a two-seam changeup from his four-seam to really break and move away against lefties. It's been a big K pitch for him. Matt Carpenter leads it off for the Cardinals. 272, 28 homers last year, 44 doubles. As has often been said about him, he may not be the prototypical leadoff hitter, at least in the sense that we used to know leadoff hitters, but he gets on base, he scores runs, he hits for power, and it seems like he will break camp as the leadoff hitter for St. Louis. In the air to right field, Betts running out from under his cap, cannot make the play. So winds up in the first row of seats just beyond the bullpen. Yeah, and Jess, I think eventually the Cardinals would love to move Carpenter out of that leadoff spot, whether it's this year, whether it's sometime down the road, just because he profiles so well in the middle of the lineup with his on base and his power, but he's not really yet to take over that slot. He's so comfortable there, and I know people can say it's only the, the first inning of a game that you're actually leading off, but there is something about Carp and his confidence, the, his ability to get deep into a count two strikes especially and feel comfortable work the count but watch him right now even dig in on the plate I mean, this guy will crowd he'll make a pitcher uncomfortable especially one that might struggle with command right off the bat and he laces it into right field for a base hit and this is why Matt Carpenter likes to crowd the plate I mean he's a guy that's strong to the right side of the field you see where he's positioned that back foot so this pitch is breaking away from him. He's able to get around it enough to really get that line drive barrel on the ball into his power zone in right field. And he's starting to heat up now. Two little under two weeks to go till opening day, and he's starting to swing. A homer and a double yesterday. A rocket here to start things off this afternoon. Here's Steven Piscotti. Had a Great season with the Cardinals last year. Was not with them the whole time. Had 233 at bats with St. Louis and hit over 300. Trying to elevate the ball a little bit more, add a little bit more power. But boy, does he have a sweet stroke. He's just so smooth. I mean, I was talking to him before the game, just saying, because I had such a violent swing. And I'm like, I always look at guys like you. And he's just so calm and so effective. It doesn't even look like he's trying. But yet he, he's able to really put a lot of pop on the ball. He's got that big boy power too. He, he can he can miss hit a ball to right center field and drive it out. I don't know if it shows on TV, but being around him, he's big. He is big. And he can hit that effortless fly ball to right center. But to me, he looks already just like a very mature veteran hitter at a young age. Did you guys have the secret Stanford handshake down uh, behind the cage today? <laughs> uh, Aaron and I. I don't know. <laughs> If we could keep this conversation going throughout the game and just talk about <laughs> how many times Stanford beat USC in football last year, that would wow. be phenomenal. Because yeah. <laughs> the one thing minute. Aaron's so good-natured about is USC football <laughs> losing again. That's he's he's so easy going about. Not that. once but twice, Dan. Not <laughs> once but twice. Yeah, enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> oh, two on the way outside. A ball and two strikes on Piscotti. Clay Buckholtz in 2013 had a 174 ERA. It was 12 and 1, 174 in early July. Suffered a neck injury, didn't pitch again that year. Had an ERA over five two years ago. And last year kind of split the difference. 7 and 7, 326. Again, though, injuries only made 18 starts. He has been on the DL each of the last six years, seven times total in his career. 
And when you look at the Boston rotation, obviously David Price is the one. That's that's no secret. But then after that, John Farrell has guys like Clay Buckholtz, Rick Porcello, Joe Kelly. I mean, it. Uh, you could get a lot out of each of those guys, but you you can't quite be certain you're going to get a lot out of each of those well, guys. Well, therein lies the question marks with this team, and they're all over the diamond, frankly, but there is tremendous upside potential across the diamond as well and in that starting rotation. They recently got really good news in talking to them before the game. Eduardo Rodriguez, their young left-handed starter who they thought would be out for a while. He's pitching well and doesn't look like he's going to be out too long. But they need some guys to step up that have had some inconsistent years if they're going to return to the top of the East. Rodriguez out with a, uh, a knee injury right now. What did you guys think? You know, when David Price became a free agent, I think a lot of people, I, I thought he would wind up as either a Cub or a Dodger. I, I, I thought those were two places. Did you, what did you think of him going to Boston? Did well, surprise you? Well, no, because they... Uh, they eventually overwhelmed him is from a, from a contract standpoint. Right. And they said, we're going to blow anyone out of the water. They thought they could go without a quote-unquote ace a season ago. Well, it didn't work out for them. And so I think they made the conscious decision, especially with Dave Dombrowski coming in, saying, we need an ace at the top of this rotation, and they were not going to let themselves be outbid for the guy that they wanted, the guy that they earmarked at the start of the offseason David Price they had the ideal offseason their two top priorities not just to get the ace but also improve their bullpen and like few teams are unable to do during the offseason is do exactly what their objectives are of course they had the money to back it this is a really good battle right now with Buckholz and Piscotti and, and, and at this point in in spring training we're starting to see it get a little more regular season time. You know, early in spring, especially veteran established players, they're just working on different things. And in this at bat, we've seen that two 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 seam change up you talked about in the open, Jess, and and, and we've seen some good fastballs in. Piscotti showing his discipline, showing his plate coverage here. On the appeal, he went. Finally, the at-bat ends with Buckles striking out Piscotti. Another changeup, and you see the location of this pitch, and the, and the reason why Piscotti, this is so hard to handle as a hitter, because you're battling, you're battling, you're battling, and you see late on this pitch, and it looks like he did go around, but, it, but that's the kind of reaction you want to have, is to hold up at that last minute, but... And typically, you don't see a lot of right-on-right -right change ups and he saw three in that bat, it just shows you the arm speed that Buckholz has going on that. He fooled a really good hitter a lot with that changeup. Now he starts Matt Holliday with a slow breaking ball. The count is 0-1 on the now bearded Matt Holliday, who has been playing left field, obviously, but has also been playing a lot of first base for the Cardinals here in the spring, and that's one of the many storylines for them. They've got Matt Adams. They've got Brandon Moss. Piscotti can play first, although it sounds like he's going to be in the outfield. But there is a there is a distinct a real chance that Matt Holiday is going to get some pretty serious first base time with St. Louis. Yeah, and, and my first thought on that when I heard that was, you've got Adams, you've got Moss, and you've got Piscotti, all guys capable of playing. Why would you even mess with Matt Holiday? Well, that gets back to Piscotti, I think. Possible double play ball, and we'll pick this up when we come back. Around the horn they go. End of one in Jupiter. No score between the Red Sox and the Cardinals.
Baseball is back, and it's free. Go to ESPN.com slash Fantasy Baseball or download the brand-new app to sign up today. With Jessica Mendoza, Aaron Boone, Buster Only, I'm Dan Schulman. Glad you're with us. Clay Buck Holtz and the Red Sox taking on the Cardinals today. No scores. We go to the top of the second. And Marco Gonzalez misses up and away ball one to Hanley Ramirez. And I think without question, the biggest story or stories around Red Sox spring training have been what will they get out of Ramirez and with the position switch to first and what will they get out of Sandoval at third. The weight is an issue. He's DHing today. Travis Shaw's at third base. And we're going to see these three guys hitting this inning. Ramirez, Shaw, Sandoval. And they all bring something different to the table. They're all, they're all part of the conversation. But let's start with Hanley and the position change. What have you guys heard, seen, or gathered about the move to first base for him this year? Well, just watching him take ground balls today, which I was really excited to get here and see. Shift on. Dropped by Wong. And the air will allow Ramirez to reach. Well, just a routine ground ball here. And Colton just really in the transfer as he's securing the ball, just kind of bobbles it. One of those things you're glad that happens in spring and not in the regular season. But in watching Hanley take ground balls today, I had my questions coming into spring training. I thought he looked extremely comfortable. And just around being around the Red Sox and talking to people that I trust what they're telling me, they feel like it's going to be a non-issue and he has a chance to be very good over there. Here's Travis Shaw. I think now the thing you got to get is him being healthy and being that impact middle of the order bat that they signed, thought they signed a year ago because he's so important to adding length and legitimate impact, but he's got to be healthy. And that shoulder, you start to hurt that, especially later in your career, it becomes a concern. And here's Shaw. All he's been doing all spring is hit. Ramirez is going to make the turn, head to third, throw on a bounce, the tag, and they got him. Ramirez out at third, Shaw into second on the throw. Well, first of all, the reason why Shaw's had so much success, he's been able to go opposite field. But you see Ramirez, and this is what you want to do a lot of times in spring training is push outfielders, kind of test. But this was center field, shallow, was a shallow hit ball. Fielding right when he was crossing. I think this is like beyond risky, but this is the time to do it This is the time to test your legs. It looks silly now, but that's when you want to figure out when can I go? When can I take an extra bag? John Farrell might say well, maybe with one out instead of nobody out. <laughs> that's, that's another yeah, right yeah. <laughs> I agree though. With, yeah. I agree with Jess there. You want to find out these things especially Hanley who's been He's been, at times early in his career, a huge speed threat, right? But, you know, as you get older, what am I capable of doing? Who am I capable of running on? For Cardinals fans, too, to see Grichik throw somebody out. Remember, he had the elbow issue at the end of last year. When he came back, he wasn't really able to throw much at all. Made a nice throw on a bounce there. So Shaw takes second on the throw, and here's Sandoval, who, as fans will recall, gave up switch hitting last year. Went two for 41 from the right side. And packed it in as a switch hitter. He left the rest of the way, but he is back to switch hitting here this year. It, it doesn't get talked about that much because so many other things have been talked about with Sandoval. And as is often the case, his weight is at the center of the conversation. He has not had a good spring defensively. And as you mentioned, Aaron Shaw, the guy standing out at second base, he can play both corners, but he's played a fair bit of third base here this spring. Yeah, and, and last year in the minor leagues, played about 60% third bases. Pablo works that walk here with one out. But by all accounts, Shaw, the Red Sox feel like he's very capable of being an average defensive third baseman. And that's a look at Pablo when he reported to spring training. Many in the Boston area were frustrated with the weight at which he showed up feeling like he needed to drop some pounds and now as he's over 30 years of age it's only going to continue to be a story especially when you're in a position battle with an upstart Travis Shaw to say that picture went viral or however you say that kind of thing that it, it did and, and he's kind of sensitive to yeah. that conversation but you know they're paying him what is it 19 million dollars a year five years 95 million and, and they need they need him to be the best panda he can be. And I think it gets overplayed the weight 
with how he, I mean, really they wanted to hit. I yeah. mean, obviously you want his defense, of course, you want the well run, but Pablo is with the Red Sox with that contract because he can hit. He can hit big. He can hit with that weight. So I don't think that's the biggest issue as it is, is his movement, and what he can do defensively, and then he, on top of that, he's not hitting. And that's where Travis Shaw comes into the conversation. Well, let's bring Buster in. Yeah, guys, one thing to think about, too, is they make this decision. Remember, Dave Dombrowski came in to take over the Red Sox baseball operations with about two months to play last year, and Travis Shaw played great after he joined the team. And on top of that, it wasn't Dombrowski who made the decision to sign Sandoval. It wasn't him who made the decision to sign Hanley Ramirez. So he can essentially look at the personnel he has and decide, you know what, we're going to have the right. best guys play and he's not necessarily wedded to one player or another. Remember, the previous regime didn't want to buy an ace, and it was Dombrowski who said, no, nope, we're going to change that, and went out and got David Price. Principal owner John Henry in attendance here in Jupiter this afternoon. And Buster makes a great point, because I think that's why Travis Shaw is really more in the conversation than really he should have been last year. I mean, he hit well last year, and I don't feel like he got a fair chance to really at the time beat out Ramirez at first base when he had more power and better numbers. But I think this year with a new regime, I think it's an easier decision, and that's why I think you see not just first and third, but also with Castillo up right now, he's pushing this guy too in left field. It could be a guy who maybe doesn't have a specific position, Aaron, but finds his way to 400 at bats over the course of the year. Absolutely. And right now we're going to make a huge deal over who is the opening day starter at X position. But it, when you really think about it, think about this in terms of four different positions. So you, you've got first base, designated hitter, third base, and left field. Four positions, and you've got five guys essentially in Shaw, Ortiz, Ramirez, Sandoval, and Castillo. You're going to need all those guys, and it's easy to find at bats for five guys in four spots over time. But it's going to be a big story, especially if at the start of the season, Travis Shaw beats out Pablo Sandoval for the third base job, which many feel like if the season were to start today, Travis Shaw would be in the lineup. Molina is going to head to the mound to talk to Gonzalez, who has walked the last two batters. What a tie a bow on the Sandoval and Ramirez story. Here's what they did last year. Now, Ramirez was hitting great. He had 10 home runs in April, then ran into kind of the garage door yep. down the left field line at Fenway, suffered a, a shoulder injury, didn't hit very well the rest of the season, did not play well in left field at all during the season. Sandoval did not have a good year. Obviously they did not live up to the hype or the contracts uh, that they signed with the Red Sox. And, and I think Aaron you said it before. I mean no team in the division may have more upside. No team in the division may have more question marks than the Boston Red Sox. Yeah and, and <laughs> it's so true Jess. I mean I look out there and there's a lot to be excited about but there is a lot on the you see the numbers too with, with Sandoval and Ramirez. You gotta remember this team hit at the end of last season yep. without those guys. And I think that's when you mentioned upside. <laughs> Imagine if those guys even just have decent seasons, what it can do to boost what really is a great offense with Betts Bogarts. I mean, you got this guy right here, Jackie Bradley Jr., up and down. I think if he gets going. At 249 last year, 10 home runs, did have a hot and cold season as he takes the curveball away. Oh, yeah. The fans are on home plate umpire Nick Lentz on every pitch right now. That one was definitely outside. Base is loaded, one out and a full count. No score here in the top of the second. This is where as a hitter, you, you kind of know you're getting something hard on that outer half. Pretty well located though there down, Jess. He'll get another opportunity. And he's been struggling the last two walks on the right side of the plate. And struggle, I mean, I think they've been close calls, and I think that's why the, the fans are riding blue behind the plate, because that cutter that he's been throwing to these lefties, it's away, and then into the righties, hasn't been getting called. line and this is going to score a couple. Castillo on his way to third and in there with a slide on a two-run double by Jackie Bradley Jr. 
Well, guys, it's what we started to see from Jackie Bradley Jr. in the second half, an outstanding defensive center field, but was he going to ever be able to hit? And we started to see more and more of this, and this is a bat at bat where he just got himself into a decent account and finally got a mistake he could handle. But you could see the approach there. 3-2 count, nowhere to put him. He just set his sights on the outer half of the plate. That ball's left up. He's able to get the barrel to it and drive in the first two runs of this ball game. The maturity of Bradley continues here in late March. So two to nothing, Boston leads in the top of the second and the batter now is catcher Christian Vasquez. Vasquez who missed all of last year after elbow surgery, Tommy John surgery to be specific, figures to be ticketed for Triple A at the start of the season. We've got Blake Swihart, who of course spent a lot of time with the Red Sox last year, and also Ryan Hannigan. So it sounds like Vasquez will continue to work back to full health, get that arm going again, get it up to 100%. And it, you know, you don't think about Tommy John with position players very much, but it's obviously incredibly important for a catcher. Matt Weeders is going through the same thing, and it's been kind of a bumpy road back for Weeders from that surgery. Especially because I think there's that a reaction to rush them back a little bit quicker than you would a pitcher because they don't think they throw as much, but in re reality, a catcher throws more than a pitcher does. I think that's where they're trying to be smart about this, and especially because Vasquez is known for having a cannon of an arm, so you don't want to take that tool away from him. Now, two years ago, in limited chances, he threw out better than 50% of opposing base stealers. They, foul for count. They love Christian Vasquez in this organization, and we're going to talk a lot, obviously, about Yadier Molina today and his impact on this Cardinal team over the years behind the plate. A lot of people feel like Vasquez is out of that same mold, that ability to impact on the defensive side. How much will he hit, we don't know yet, but they feel like his impact defensively and with his mind Boy. is tremendous. Buster's got more. Yeah, and guys, actually, Christian Vasquez looks at Yachty as a mentor. The moment that he was called up to the big leagues, he got a text right away from Molina, who he works with during the offseason. He watches everything Molina does. All right, Buster, good stuff. Thank you. So having a moment here as he's in the batter's box with his mentor behind the plate, and there is the third walk given up this inning by Gonzalez, and he's going to get a visit. And I think right now, too, the Red Sox are doing a good job. Of they're almost sitting in what Marco Gonzalez is known for is his changeup. He's got one of the best changeups in the in the minors last season, and this is a team right now that offensively their game plan is to sit and wait. And that's why you see these foul balls down the line. They're waiting, they're waiting, and they're wasting. They're wasting pitches, and they're also able to see his ball traveling a lot more and taking more pitches because of it. Now they didn't start. We've got some activity now. Miguel Sokolovich is up in the Cardinals pen. They didn't start the clock. One of the new rules in baseball this year is for visits to the mound like that. It's supposed to be 30 seconds or less. And I believe it's from when the manager or coach hits the dirt when he's up at the top of the dugout and on his way to the field until he leaves the mound. I think Derek Lilliquist did it with like seven, eight seconds to spare. He was booting it out there today. But again, just trying to not necessarily make everybody crazy about the time of game, but to try to you know cut down in easy spots and, and if they can trim a little time on visits to the mound they'll try to do that this year back to the top of the order for Mookie Betts Gonzalez has thrown over 30 pitches already here in the second inning and that's why there's activity behind him and you see right now against these right handed hitters Jesse you've kind of touched on it it's fastball changeup. You, you don't really have to deal with the breaking ball he doesn't have that third pitch so it becomes imperative that he command the inside part of the plate to set up that changeup. But these Red Sox right-handed hitters are just laying on the ball out over the plate, and he doesn't really have his changeup at this point in the ball game, and that's really what's hurt him. Yep, and that cut fastball that usually comes and rides into these righties, he, he hasn't established exactly what you said. He needs to establish that inside part of the plate, and it wasn't getting call, called early, and now he's just gone away from it. Pop up, shallow right field. Wong still backpedaling will make the catch. Two down. Runners hold their ground. But even though it's been a struggle so far today for Gonzalez, 
he looks healthy to me. And I think now it's just about getting in that good rhythm, finding that feel and command for the changeup. And I think there is a chance that he could still help them at this point this year. It's going to be important for him, if he does go down to AAA, to just log those healthy innings where he's back and pitching pain-free again, which was an issue for him in 15. Brock Holt, the batter. Gonzalez got right in on Holt in his first at bat. Broke his bat on a ground ball back to the mound. Starts him with a strike over the inside corner here this inning. Look at the Red Sox potential bench if Holt is a part of it if we assume Shaw right now is a part of it although he could play a lot you got Hannigan who's a, a quality backup catcher uh, they signed Chris Young veteran outfielder it's a pretty good group to come off the bench it's, that's a really good group. it's more you know we've touched on the upside it, it goes with the bench as well their depth is potentially very solid. Brock Holt, an all-star a year ago, over 400 at-bats. There's all the positions and the games played, which he played last year. I think they'd like to see him play a little less, maybe 300, 400 at-bat range, and just moving him around. He could spell guys, but just really, really established himself as a valuable player in this league a year ago. Just missed two and two. It's funny because with his skill set, on, you'd say, well, boy, this guy should be in the National He's working. Come on. But he has, like, a National League existence on an American League team, bouncing around and playing five days a week. Yeah, especially, so. you know, with some of the veteran players and some of the injury history that they have had, critical to have a guy like Brock Holder. Left center field and caught by a diving Randall Gritchick to end the inning. Red Sox get a couple. Cardinals coming up when we come back. One of their horses in Adam Wainwright, who has had such a great career with St. Louis as a reliever back as a rookie, then as one of the best starters in baseball for many, many years. Four times in his career, he has finished in the top three for a Cy Young Award. He's won 20 games twice. He's won 19 games on two other occasions. And he's standing by with Buster Olney. Adam, you've been talking about how well you feel this spring. Why do you think that is? Well, people keep asking me. I just feel, I feel good, you know. Uh, I came back pretty fast from, from Achilles surgery. I was able to play last year, and I, I don't know if that just kind of eased my mind about whether I was going to be able to come back strong this year or not, but 
that time off allowed my whole entire body to heal up from, from a lot of innings over the years. And, and uh, you have to look at it like that, right? I mean, I did not want to miss that time. If I could go back and not get hurt, obviously, I would, I would choose that path. But I, I did get hurt, and, and uh, you have to, to take the good with the bad. My body was able to heal up a lot of different, a lot of different little nagging things um, in that time. What's the practical impact of all this, you think, on your pitching this spring? Well, I, you know, it's it's allowed me to to get a better long toss program. I'm able to to throw my sides with a little more intensity. Um, you know, I'm a bullet saver, anyways. Usually, I, I go out there and I'm 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 playing very light catch and just making sure I get my my body in the right positions. But it's been fun being able to stretch a little bit out, and, and hopefully, uh, we'll see the rewards of that during the season. Been making an effort on behalf of folks in Flint, Michigan, who've had trouble with their water. Explain what your effort has been. Well, we, we, we love creating charity ideas that people have fun doing. So we did a, an NCAA bracket challenge this year, and, and uh, we did a free challenge for whoever wanted to play in it. And we've had uh, thousands of people sh sign up and, and play. And the idea is, you know, if you want to donate, we'd love for you to donate on bigleagueimpact.org. But even if you can't, spread awareness to it. Pass it along to somebody uh, who can and, and pass the website along or pass the information along or just let people know that there's people up in Flint, Michigan that are struggling right now with, with their water crisis. And, and it's not just water, it's, it's food, it's food, it's waste. There's a lot of stuff going on up there right now that the, the people of Flint need help with. And we're trying to, to bring help through a, a fun challenge like the NCAA Bracket Challenge. A lot of conversation during the winter time about what the Cubs did. What was the conversation after the Cubs added the guys like John Lackey, like Jason Hayward, Ben Zobers in the Cardinals clubhouse? Well, they added some great players and some great big league players who have proven track records. And, and to go along with their, their great young players who also have proven track records, it's going to be a, a very tough team to play against for sure. And, and uh, we love playing the Cubs. We love going to Chicago. It's my favorite place to play. I love the city of Chicago. I love the fans, even if they're, they're going to boo me probably pretty heavily this year. Uh, we have a great time playing against them. But, you know, whatever they did in the offseason has no bearing on what we're doing inside our clubhouse. And that's really all we can worry about is – uh, showing up every day with the intention and the expectation to win games. Some of the questions for you guys. Randall Grichik, Stephen Piscotty, perhaps playing greater roles this year. What have you seen in those two? Well, I think, you know, you've watched the game so far. Randall's made a few great plays out there in center field already. He's a dynamic player with huge power potential. And, and Stephen Piscotty is, has got a, a swing that just is just so long through the zone. You know, it's, 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 it's always... Uh, really fun for me to watch guys bat pass. And when I watch Stephen Piscotty, he's, he's going to be a very tough out for pitchers because his barrel is in the zone for a very long time. It's not a long swing, but it's long in the zone. And, and pitchers have a hard time with guys who have swings like that. That's not in and out. He can drive it to all fields. So he's been very impressive to watch. Adam, thanks. Guys, back to you. All right, Buster. Adam, thank you. Great stuff from Adam Wainwright. As Grichik drives a fly ball deep to right field off the top of the wall. And Grichik's great afternoon continues just two innings in. Adam Wainwright talked about a couple of plays he made in the outfit. So he's thrown out a runner, made a great diving catch. Now he's got a double. Typical day for an outfielder. <laughs> what I like about Grichik, you'll notice that flat bat that he starts with. And he kind of just goes and gets this pitch, but he sees it so deep. And he allows this ball to travel. A lot of times when you think power numbers, you think pull power. Of course, he might need to get in the weight room, bragged by his teammates a bit. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate warning track power when he actually hit the top of the wall and it stays in. That's just bad luck. <laughs> and those 47 extra base hits came in 323 at bats. Big time power for Randall Grichik. Matt Adams is the batter now. Well, Adam Wainwright, uh, after the question from Buster, talked a little bit about the Cardinal Cub rivalry. This is going to be a big, big thing this year. Uh, of course, they met in the playoffs last year. The Cubs won. The Cubs appear to be even stronger. And two of the three guys that Buster mentioned that they picked up were Cardinals in Hayward and Lackey. And there were some comments back and forth. Uh, two great teams. I almost feel like people are sleeping on the Cardinals a little bit. The Cubs deserve all the hype and attention they're getting. They won 97 games last year, and they appear to be stronger right now. Uh, but you just can't sleep on the Cardinal. But this could be a great, and the, and the Pirates, of course, as well. This could be a great, great rivalry and race again on the National League. I think it's the best rivalry going into this season, especially when you consider that they played each other in the postseason yep. last year with the Cubs knocking them out. You talk about the two guys switching uniforms, two impact guys, and going to the Cubs. Oh! 
The Cardinals, who won 100 games last year without Adam Wainwright and without Mike Leake, they now take the place, essentially, of Lance Lynn and John Lackey. And I think on paper, you could make the case that you, you take that if you're the Cardinals. And, and there is that underlying chip on the Cardinals' shoulder inside their clubhouse. Like, yeah, keep talking about the Cubs. Yeah, keep the, talking about the Cubs. Throughout the season, it's just going to get bigger, too, yeah. because if the Cubs even start to just have a decent season, which obviously with their talent, they should have an excellent one. I mean, the media, everything around the history, everything about the Cubs is only going to gain momentum, which then just further drives the Cardinals to want to beat them. Adams lifts a fly ball that is carrying the left center field, but Bradley drops it. They're going to call it an out, and they're going to say he dropped it on the transfer. So Adams is, Adams is still standing at second base, but he is out on a fly ball. Richick did go back to tag and goes to third on the out. Well, we're getting a good look this inning at the impact of some that Florida can have where the wind can wreak some havoc. We saw the ball of Grichik hit, get caught up in the wind and, and, and get to the fence. This ball's hit well off the bat of Adams, but that wind kind of holds it up for Jackie Bradley Jr. And Jess, I think clearly he does catch that ball and is losing it on the transfer. It's a great call. I mean, I think from our vantage point, way behind home plate, not as close. It looked like he just dropped it as he was running back. So all you did really see it was his back, but... And then the appeal on whether or not Grichik left too early. Smart of Grichik. I mean, to get back, make sure that he waited. So two down and a runner at third for Yadier Molina. Molina had not one but two surgeries on his left thumb. Suffered a torn ligament during the season. Uh, and he came back. Remember, he came back for the playoffs at the end of the year, but then had to shut it down again. I don't think he played in the last game of the the series against the Cubs and had two surgeries. The first one just didn't take. They did it again in December. And it's only in the last couple of days where he's been allowed to swing the bat. He actually was appearing in spring training games, but was not allowed to swing. But it's healthy enough now that he can as he grounds out and ends the inning through two. Red Sox up to the number. ESPN will broadcast the first Major League Baseball game emanating from Cuba since 1999. The Rays take on the Cuban national team in Havana on ESPN tomorrow 
at 1.30 Eastern Time. And ESPN Deportes will provide the exclusive Spanish-language telecast. The game will also be streamed live via Watch ESPN. Uh, we saw it, I'm sure millions of people saw the photographs of the president, Barack Obama, landing in Cuba yesterday and he is expected to be present at the baseball game tomorrow. I mean this is something that very recently you just never could have envisioned happening. And now the president is in Cuba. They're gonna play a baseball game. Cuban national team of the Tampa Bay Rays tomorrow president expected to be there. He's the first sitting United States president to visit Cuba since the revolution in 1959. So that's got the feel of kind of must see TV tomorrow afternoon. Some of the images we've got to see over the last 24 hours as Bogarts can't hold up his swing on that slider for the first out have been breathtaking. Seeing Air Force One yeah. actually fly into the city, seeing some of the architecture in the city, you know, you know, in my lifetime, you know, obviously I haven't seen many photos or images or video of, of Cuba, but... You know, it was interesting getting the chance to talk to Brian Pena, the, the backup catcher that I think we're going to have an opportunity to speak to later. You know, the hope that he kept mentioning about that hopefully this trip just has a positive impact on Cuba, on America, and on the relationship yeah. there. Well, you talk about the images. I mean, the players, the, the Tampa Bay players that have, have been able to reunite with family and that's to me the emotion and so much of this that goes obviously well beyond baseball but there's players on this field right now from Cuba that, that don't get to see their family that are going to be able to because of what the Obama administration is going to allow and change really our relationship that I know in our lifetime we've never seen. Well, more and more Cuban players making their way to the United States to Major League Baseball to professional baseball as a whole. Rusni Castillo of the Red Sox, of course, is Cuban, as is Roenis Elias and Joan Mancada. And when you think about uh, Jose Abreu and Joan Cespedes and Yasiel Puig, uh, I mean, there's tremendous baseball talent in Cuba, and more and more of it is now coming to Major League Baseball. There's uh, Rusni Castillo looking on from the dugout. Let's bring in Buster Olney with more. Yeah, guys, think about the choice that people like Brian Pena and Castillo have had to make along the way, leave their families behind as they defected, not knowing if they would ever see family members again, not knowing if they could ever go back. And that's what Eduardo Perez, whose uh, roots are in Cuba, was talking about recently in a conversation how... Now, if you're 14, 15, 16 years old with a change in rules with Major League Baseball where they can now essentially contract players directly rather than have the players have to defect to another country before coming to the United States, he talked about the hope that that engendered, that now you're going to see teenagers believing that they have a dream that they can pursue right away without leaving their families behind. I'm looking forward to hearing Eduardo as part of the broadcast crew tomorrow on ESPN, 1.30 Eastern Time. Also, I'm told that Louis Tion, former Red Sox great, a great, great pitcher from Cuba, that he is among those who have been invited by Major League Baseball to throw out one of the ceremonial opening pitches tomorrow. I mean, this is going to be, it's going to be a great, great event to watch. Meanwhile, on the mound right now for St. Louis is right-hander Miguel Sokolovich. Who comes on after Marco Gonzalez went two innings, had a very good first inning, but lost his command, walk three in the second inning. There's a fair ball slammed past Adams off the bat of Travis Shaw into the right field corner. Hanley Ramirez will be held at third. Shaw has his second hit of the game as his spring batting average creeps up toward the 500 mark. Well, he's done it. Since he's gotten to the big leagues against both left and right-handed pitching, we saw him go back up the middle against the lefty Gonzalez in his first at bat and first pitch swinging here aggressively turns this ball just down the right field line. Another extra base hit for a guy that is making a huge impression. And I love the way he talks about it too. He says, "I want to make this decision difficult." For the Red Sox. I want. Done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I love it. You know, and you can just tell he's having fun out there. He's enjoying the game. And he doesn't have a target on his back. And you know as a player, Booney, like, that's the best position to be in. Uh, when you're a true athlete competitor is you want to go after 
a position and and you, you want to work for it and compete but also just really push the envelope with come on and, well we talk about chips on your shoulder and, and i think travis shaw has a healthy chip on his shoulder it was a ninth round pick wasn't a huge prospect coming up through the minor leagues was definitely a prospect you know was expected to just fill a role when he got called up last year but kind of kicked his way into the conversation with the power with the production against both left and right-handed pitching and now showing the ability not only to continue to hit but also play multiple positions he is now 17 for 36 in the spring now sandoval the guy he may be competing with at third base rolls over on one but drives in a run on the ground ball Runner with third, two down, three to nothing, Red Sox, and we sent it back down to Buster Ole. Yeah, and one of the benchmarks for Shaw last year was the fact that for the first time he had to adjust to opposing pitchers' adjustments. He told me that in September he began to notice opposing pitchers were pounding him inside with fastballs, and he said that one of the keys to learning about how to deal with that was standing in the on deck circle every day during relief changes. Uh, standing in the dugout and speaking with David Ortiz. He said he helped him so much where Ortiz would tell him, look, this pitcher is going to pitch me this way, and I'm going to tell you how he's going to pitch you. And Shaw said, more time than not, he was exactly right. He hit 13 home runs and 226 at-bats last year. I mean, he made an impression last year. It's not just this spring that he's really making an impression on this team. Well, and I think what people like to see from the corner positions, too, is his power. And that's exactly what the Red Sox, I think, were missing, even though they had the great offensive production, is they didn't get the power from Sandoval and, and Ramirez that they were expecting. And that's where Shaw said, I, I can bring it. Rosny Castillo walked his first time up. Now he's popped one up. Wong calls off Adams, and the inning is over. Another run for the Red Sox and a three to nothing lead. Through two and a half. We're not going to go to break. We're going to keep it right here right now. Talk about a rule change that has generated a lot of, of discussion around baseball earlier in spring. Tim Kirkjian and Jess and Aaron broke down the new slide rule out at second base. This is a collision of per two perfect events. You've got Howie Kendrick, the hitter, a slow developing play. So it's going to be very difficult to turn this double play. Where Ruben Tejada, though, gets himself in trouble is when he comes out to get this throw and then loses loses sight of the runner, loses his internal clock of the runner, and gets himself into a really bad position with Chase Utley, a guy who's known to come in very hard, bearing down on him. And the reason for the rule change is because it was legal for Chase Utley to change his path. He's come into second. He recognized Tejada is off, so now he is no longer going to second base. He's going to Tejada, and he comes in late. What Look does at, late I, mean, Jess? Late means I'm beginning my slide when I'm even not before the bag but even with the bag and I'm coming in high I'm coming at his knees I am taking out ultimately ending up breaking Ruben Tejada's leg the best thing I think about this rule is it protects the integrity of this play because you can still initiate contact you can still try and break this play up but you've got to hit the dirt beforehand which is going to protect you guys from that catastrophic injury so here's what the new rule actually looks like. There are four parts to it. The runner has to slide before the bag. You've got to hit the ground before you reach the base. You've got to be able to reach the base with your hand or foot, which you were always supposed to do, but I guess it's being emphasized more now. You have to be able to remain on the base at the completion of your slides. You can't go sl sliding four feet beyond the base. And maybe the last one is the most important. You cannot change your path for the purpose of initiating contact with the middle infielder and a lot of this obviously had to do with the utley tahada play also jung ho gong was injured last year ruben tahada by the way now a member of the cardinals the mets released him just a few days ago and the cardinals who have johnny peralta out for a few months with a thumb injury so they as for some depth or maybe a chance to start they have signed tahada but what do you guys think about what baseball has done in implementing this new rule yeah i think in addition to the points that we just showed, they also went ahead and defined what a slide is. And I think that was key. And the biggest point was 
being able to slide below the knees. If you're going to have that contact, which Booney said so well, it still needs to happen. You want to be able to break up a double play. But when you're talking about the knee and above, it's obviously intentionally to hurt somebody. So a slide is now defined to be the knee or below. And I think that was a big part of the rule as well. Colt Wong, the batter. I would say the one part of the rule that I don't like is that you can't change direction. I think they... I think they went a long way in eliminating the injury when they defined the slide of having to hit the ground first. Right. And I think, for me, that would have been enough. Now they've you can't deviate your path at all, which, you know, I don't love, but... So you still want to be able to slide in the direction of the fielder as long as you're doing everything yes. else properly. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Because I just think that further keeps the integrity... Of the, of the position, yeah. and one of the skill sets necessary to play second base at the big league level is to be able to turn to and be able to deal with traffic around the bag. That's part of the skill set of being a quality major league second baseman. I still think they've protected that, but I think had they not added the deviating your, your path, I, I think it would have furthered. But do you like the fact that something was done? Was it time? Was it necessary? to do something out at second base. Baseball did it a few years ago at home plate after Buster Posey was injured. Now they do it out at second base after Ruben Tejada was injured. I mean, that's normally how these things work. Was it time to make a change? My initial thought was no, it wasn't time, but after they, they did their due diligence and watched this, I actually think it's a pretty good rule now because, like I said, I think for the most part, they've kept the integrity of that play and really defined what you are and are not allowed to do because there was a lot of gray area out there about what you could do going into second base, breaking it up. I think they've made it clear now. And well, and I think protecting runners too. I mean, a lot of things, one of the things that was not talked about was Chase Utley. And of course, it's his decision to slide like that, but I guaranteed he got a concussion from, from that slide, the oh, way yeah. that he slid into him and even coming off the field. And he sat there for a second. So I think it's both sides, the fact that that kind of slide is not healthy for either one. Three nothing. The Red Sox lead. Cardinals batting in the bottom of the third. Colton Wong at first, nobody out, and Jed Jerko is the batter. Another guy who could could figure into the mix at short. He can also play second and third. Former San Diego Padre. Good power from the right side. The Cardinals, you know, love having guys with versatility. Love using the bench, and, and uh, Jerko is going to get his at bats. I think this was one of the really before. Johnny Peralta went down with the injury. I think this was one of the under-the-radar pickups in the offseason by the Cardinals that will pay dividends. I think Jerko, over time, is going to prove to be a productive right-handed hitter with power at the major league level and his ability to move around the infield. I think you can find him a, a, a pretty nice plethora of at-bats to, to let that power manifest itself. And this is a team that's been lacking in power, frankly, the last couple of years. Yep. The question now, though, how much shortstop can he play with Peralta down? And how, how does this situation work itself out the first couple months of the season? Is it a lot of Ruben Tejada? Is it a lot of Jerko? Does Garcia get in that mix? I still think they may make a move. I, they may not be done yet. Go get another shortstop? I, I think it's possible. I think Tejada wasn't a, didn't cost them a player, didn't cost them a ton of money. So I think it just added to their depth and their options. But I guarantee you they're still keeping an eye on what is potentially out there should there become a need, especially early in the season. Well, and I think to have middle infield depth, I mean, mm -hmm. to push Colton Wong as well. I mean, he had some inconsistencies last season. Obviously, there's so much potential, but he struggled. And I think to have a guy like Jerko, to be able to have a Tejada, to have these options, whether it's defensively, offensively, but they're not looking for one person to replace Johnny Peralta, that's for sure. They're looking for a platoon. Buck Holtz has fallen behind 3-1. and one. And this ball is laced toward left field. Down and fair and off the wall on a bounce. Wong with very good speed around third heading home. Relay to the plate, not in time. And Jerko has driven in the first run of the afternoon for the Cardinals. 
what looked like one of those two-seam fastballs that Buckholz started to incorporate more and more last year. He's continued to work on it this spring. This ball gets, I think, to where he wants, down and in, but Jerko does a good job of just kind of beating him to the spot, short to the ball, and more importantly, able to keep that ball fair down the left field line to play to run here for the Cardinals. And that's a tough pitch, running yeah. in on the hands for a righty. Be able to get that barrel the ball there in a powerful way. It's one thing. That's usually when you see a rollover, you yep. get sawed off, and it's a weak ground ball, but he's got that short, compact swing. So 3-1 the score now. Still nobody out. Back to the top of the order for Matt Carpenter, who had a base hit his first time up. In addition to the power numbers we talked about the first time that Carpenter came up, he walked 81 times last year at a very good on base percentage. You guys were talking about, you know, who else on the team could be the leadoff hitter to allow Carpenter to move down if that was something the Cardinals happen to be interested in. I think the first guy you look at is probably Juan because he's got the speed, although, again, what a leadoff hitter is now is different than what a leadoff hitter used to be, but Wong's on base percentage last year was 321. Carpenter was 365. Pretty significant difference. Yeah, and, and remember, as good a year as Matt Carpenter had last year, there was about a month and a half stretch where he, he they didn't know what was wrong with him. He had fatigue yeah. issues, and I think overall it really suffered. It, it, it cost him in the average and on base department, and I think this year you could very easily see him Hitting up around that 300 mark, another good change up there from Clay Buckholz. We've seen a number of them already this afternoon. But that on-base percentage up around 400 as well to go with the power that I think is just going to continue to soar for what he, is an elite hitter. He sets the tone. I mean, yeah. I, I think that's when you say it gets redefined. I mean, speed, all those things are nice. On base, obviously, those are the things you want to see. But at the end of the day, he's setting the tone for the game. He's setting the tone for your lineup. And there is not a better guy in this lineup than Matt Carpenter to do oh, that with his at-bats. Well, how often have we done Cardinals games and the first at-bat is 10 pitches? Yep. You know, and, and, you know, you guys tell me, I hear from players all the time, how much it helps them to stand in the on-deck circle and see so many pitches from the pitcher. And this guy is the guy getting all those looks for all of his teammates. Now the change up, but it misses outside. So Buckholz laboring here in the third, gave up a base hit, but got a double play in the first, gave out a one-out double, didn't allow a run, though, in the second. But a walk and a double here to open up the third, and a full count on Carpenter. The third spring appearance for Buckholz, last time out, five days ago against the Twins, went four innings and gave up three earned runs. Way up in the air in a shallow right center field, and it finally settles into the mid of Bradley for out number one. Well, to finish up on Carpenter, uh, a unique skill set for a guy. You know, you talked about how big Piscotty looks when he walks by. Uh, Carpenter's not a guy who jumps out. Man, that guy's big, but he's got big power. 28 homers, 44 doubles, led the National League last year in that department, and top 10 of the league in OPS as well. And still, it feels to me anyways guys sometimes overlooked with what he's done over the last three four years Yeah, and consider the impact he's been in the postseason for the Cardinals. He's just that guy you feel like You send the best pitchers out there against him in crunch time and he just Always continues to have good at bats and a lot of times good powerful at bats that We've seen in the postseason from him and we've talked about Stephen Piscotti, who's up right now, Randall Grichuk, a lot of the young guys that come up, and it helps so much. And even talking to Piscotti to have a Matt Carpenter to help you figure out how to work these pitchers, how to understand the video and the content and your swing and the pressure and everything that comes along with being a big, big league pitcher. Fly ball carrying out to right field. Back on the edge of the track is Betts to run it down. And tagging and coming to third now with two outs is Jerko. Well, 
So here's Matt Holiday in the last year of a seven year contract. Had some injuries last year, cost him most of the season. Leg issues, only hit four home runs and about 220 at bats. Still a presence in the batter's box. And I think another one of the guys where the, you know, if you're looking for the Cardinals to hit more home runs, and it figures they will this year, it seems like they will this year. But if Holiday can get back to being, say, a 20 to 25 home run guy, that would certainly help their cause. Yeah, we started to touch on it earlier. We could see Matt Holiday play some first base, which when I first thought of that is why you've got all these first basemen on the on the roster. But I think it comes down to what you potentially have in the outfield and how good they think Stephen Piscotty is in the corner. So if 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 you say against a left-handed pitcher were able to throw Holiday at first base, then you'd have an outfield of potentially Piscotty, Richick, Tommy, Tommy Pham. Pham. Right. Tommy Pham's part yeah. of this equation. Yeah. Yeah. You, so you've got three defensive, you know, plus defenders out there potentially, which I think the Cardinals brass salivates at. Ground ball to short, and Holiday retired to end the inning. A run in for the Cardinals, 3-1 Red Sox at the end of three. ESPN presented by Head and Shoulders. Ann Schulman, Jessica Mendoza, Aaron Boone, Buster only glad you're with us at Roger Dean Stadium in Jupiter, Florida. The spring training home of the Cardinals and the Marlins. They share the facility. We're here for the Cardinals today as they host the Red Sox. Sokolovich back in the bound for St. Louis. Jackie Bradley Jr. swings through the first pitch for the Red Sox. We will see, we talked about the Chicago Cubs a little bit earlier. We will see the Cubs in person on Thursday. We'll have the Cubs and the San Francisco Giants for you. 0-2. Swing and a miss at a good changeup. We'll have the, the Cubs and the Giants. There's some Cub fans. At 4 o'clock Arizona time, 7 o'clock Eastern time, Thursday. Two of the top teams, or two teams that figure to be two of the top teams in the National League. Boy, he had him. Guessing and guessing wrong in that at bat as Bradley strikes out for the first out. Speaking of the National League Central, Pittsburgh wildcard team each of the last three years. They might hit Andrew McCutcheon second. He's been on the top five in NL MVP the last four years. Of course, you know what the Cubs have done. Hayward, Zobrist, Lackey. 
Great team last year, maybe even better this year. The Brewers and the Reds appear to be in full rebuilding mode right now, which a number of teams in the National League are looking at. Did I say that right? It's four o'clock. You're an Arizonan. It's yes. four o'clock. I know it's not Pacific time. Right. It's Mountain time, but you don't switch. Yes. Right. No. That's what they say in Arizona, they right? It's, it's Mountain time, but they don't switch to daylight saving. Correct. But it is three hours behind the East Coast at this time of the year. Well played, Shiloh. This this is this is that's like eighty percent of the reason we have you around, by the way. <laughs> just what so, time zone are we just so I know what time it is in Scottsdale. <laughs> But I'm looking forward to seeing the and we were told I think we're that Jake Arrieta is going to pitch in that game on Thursday. And we're hearing Bumgarner might pitch wow. for, for the, the Giants. Giants. So lucky, lucky us. Lucky us is right. And those two teams, I mean, it, it'd be hard. It's hard to predict, obviously, October. But those two teams, I would argue, would be easily head to head. An NLCS possible matchup. Cubs and Giants. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. The buzz is always big around the Cubs oh. in spring training. Yeah. It's just a huge deal. Yeah. But, man, <laughs> it is big right now. Jess and I were both there, and they are – there's a there's expectations running wild in that camp. But I love how Madden is handling it. I mean, I love I – mean, he had everything right. from shag wagons, like, with, like, dog prints and, like, tying up in a ninja – Thing going on the other day. I mean, I spent five straight days out there, and every single day before warm up, he has some kind of disco music or just to kind of ease that pressure and expectation that is bigger than ever right now in Chicago. There have been some very, very good managers who have passed through Chicago over the years, and the the weight of the <laughs> history of the Cubs always seemed to be there like a cloud hanging over the team but with Joe Madden there it you just don't he feel just that. seems he, overwhelmed he just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but look at look at these three teams for three teams in the same division to win 97 or more games and then the Cubs beat the Pirates in the wild card game and then the Cubs beat the Cardinals in the division series I mean three great teams Damn. Uh, Vasquez is retired two down but as good as the Cubs were last year, and as much as there was optimism going into the season last year, I don't think they went into the season as the favorites, as the hunted. Now, I'm not saying they should be the, but, you know, like we were talking about the Cardinals, everybody's talking about the Cubs, and not that the roles have been reversed, but you're right, guys. The expectations have been ratcheted up to a whole different level for the Cubs as the ball gets loose out of the bullpen. A whole different level of expectation for the Cubs coming into this season. But they're going to be challenged. I mean, you had the three best teams in baseball, the Cardinals, the Pirates record-wise, and the Cubs. And the, not to get into the, the Pirates, but that's a big part of this division and the fact that it's not going to be an easy road going against this team right here and then the Pirates down the road with Liriano and Cole. And, and I know no one's talking about them either, but that's a big chip. I mean, if you think the the Cardinals have a chip on their shirt. Can you imagine yeah. the Pittsburgh Pirates? Yeah. Who, by the way, had 98 wins last year. Had a great year. Let's go down to Buster. Yeah, and guys, I don't think the Pittsburgh Pirates. Aye. Buster, hold that thought. <laughs> More Buster when we come back.
Join Major League Baseball and the 30 clubs as we celebrate opening day. Show your team pride by wearing your favorite cap on April the 4th and share on social media using hashtag caps on for a chance to win prizes. Tune into all the opening day action April the 4th on ESPN. Spring training baseball is live with the MLB.com at bat app. Stay connected all spring with a radio broadcast, video highlights, stats, news, and more. Download MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball on your smartphone or tablet. Bottom of the fourth inning, Red Sox three, Cardinals one. Buck Holt still on the mound for Boston. Speaking of opening day, something new this year on the Sunday, not just the one game on Sunday night, it's a triple header on ESPN Sunday, beginning with, speaking of the National League Central, the Cardinals and the Pirates, and the second game is the Blue Jays and the Rays, and then we will be in Kansas City to see the defending World Series champion, Kansas City Royals, who coincidentally will be taking on the team they played in the World Series, the Mets. And yes, it is a coincidence. The schedule for this year is set before the playoffs last year. It just so happens the Mets and Royals open up with one another. Yeah. Oh. As Moss strikes out, first time ever that two teams who met in the World Series will meet on opening day the following year. And then there will be four games on Monday, including the game that we'll be at, which will be the Dodgers and the Padres. It's going to be fun. Yeah, it is. It's about that time. Baseball, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 It's going to be a... How many games and how many yeah. days? We all got these little goofy smirks on our faces, and we're, we're looking forward to it. Some people kind of just look like that. Like, yeah. I'm not, not going to say any names. Yeah, 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 no names. Kind of my right. He's sitting right here. Yeah. <laughs> he can hear you. Here's Randall Gritchick, who has doubled in his wanted bat, has also thrown out a runner and made a, a very nice diving catch in left center field. Mets, by the way, announcing oh. Matt Harvey will be the opening day starter, so he'll start that Sunday night game against Kansas City. Mets fans are here. Twins fans are here. Cubs fans are here. I think Florida kind of does that. Yeah. I don't know anyone that's, like, born and raised in Florida. Everyone <laughs> moves there from all over the country. Blue Jays fans are here. Everybody's here. Hey, high school beer. Spring training's fun. It is. It's cool that it's a destination now, too. Yeah. Talk to so many people. There's like, I want to make sure spring, spring break, whatever time of year, I want to get to some spring training games. It's a vacation. You bring the family. And spend three or four days, maybe with three or four different clubs. Tyler Lyons warming up in the pen. Well, you get better access to the players. Everybody's more relaxed. And, and just the way the stadiums are set up, it's not quite the way it used to be 20, 30 years ago. A lot of the new facilities are different. But you still get a lot more access to the players in spring training in Florida or Arizona than you would during the regular season. And, and so many of these places now that, that share one spot. It's been so great, not only for fans, because of, you know, you can go essentially see two clubs in a day, and, but but for the players themselves, it's just that many more home games that you play because you're going to play that team on the road. You're playing in a great facility typically. We'll see a ton of those in, in, in Arizona when we're there next week. You were, a, you, were you always a Florida spring training guy? I was always you were a always a Florida guy. Yeah. Right? Yeah, never made it to Arizona. All right, waiting patiently, and it's not easy for him to do. <laughs> Buster, you were saying. <laughs> yeah, I was saying, you guys were talking about that possible matchup on Thursday, Madison Bumgarner perhaps for the Giants against Jake Arrieta of the Cubs. I know some people won't want to watch it. How about the Pittsburgh Pirates, who in 2014 were eliminated in the wild card game by Madison Bumgarner at the beginning of one of the greatest right. runs of all time, and then in 2015 eliminated by Jake Arrieta at the back end of one of the greatest pitching runs of all time. And let me tell you something. When you are around the Pirates this spring, it's a lot like we've been talking about with the Cardinals a big chip on their shoulder. And for years, we always looked at Dave Duncan, the pitching coach of the Cardinals, as a guy who would create answers. And that's the thing about the Pirates this spring. Who will be the guys that they could create, whether it's a Jonathan Neese or perhaps a Juan Nicasio who they picked up from the Rockies. They're so good at finding solutions. Ray Searich has yeah. developed the reputation of being one of the best pitching coaches in baseball. Guys go there and they get better. You know, perfect example is Jay Happ, who was with Seattle for about four months last year, finished up with Pittsburgh, 
and pitched incredibly well for the Pirates in the last couple of months and then parlayed that into a three year deal with Toronto. So he's moved on or back to Toronto where he was earlier in his career. And look for Andrew McCutcheon. Uh, I guess that's kind of obvious. I, I should, <laughs> but remember last here? year, he got off to a really slow start. Broken bat there, base hit for Matt Adams. But he, he got off to a really slow start the first month, month and a half of the season. Not like an MVP candidate in the prime of his career, but he was dealing with a knee issue that I think really hurt him the first couple of months of the season. He is healthy this year. Look for that MVP to be MVP-like from Jump Street. And they're talking about batting him second in that lineup. And I know he was quoted just the other day saying, I I'm comfortable in that three-hole. Yeah. And I'll do it for the team. Yeah. But it it'll be a little odd to see a McCutcheon in that two spot. You know what, though? The game, I mean, as you guys know, the game has changed. Mike Trout hits second. Josh yeah. Donaldson hits second. Yeah. I mean, the game, you know, the, the guys who hit second used to be the guys who could get a bunt down, get a runner over, you know, that kind of thing. But... Uh, if it gets him another 20 plate appearances or something like that. Yeah, more and you know. more evidence all the time suggesting that maybe you should hit your best hitter second, especially if you've got a deep lineup to, like you said, get those extra at-bats. More times to do different kind of damage throughout the game. I remember going from the three spot to the two spot in college, and I fought it a little bit because as a three hitter, you know, you just think there's just that. It's a pride thing. I don't know. It was just that feeling of a two spot, in my opinion, was, you know, move them over. You got speed. You're kind of a contact hitter. There wasn't the power. And I had to just get over that on my own. Three years in college, I hit two and led our team in home runs. And I could still have that power because at the end of the day, it was just the first time through the lineup. And it was about just hitting in the runners that were ahead of me. So, Jesse, a little ego issue yeah, here. Yeah, pretty much. Going on, right? It was 19. And <laughs> All right. Base hit. Just wait, Danny. Wait, wait till we get like fourth or fifth week on Sunday night. <laughs> First hit of the spring for Yadier Molina. Yadi frustrated after his last at bat, grounded out. You can see just a beautiful job. He almost gets beat a little bit in his lower half, but his upper half, this is where his experience recognizes the change in this pitch and adjust well to get the hit. Well, remember what, what Adam Wainwright was saying about Stephen Piscotti about long through the zone. Molina was a little bit fooled there from that off-speed pitch, but because his bat was in the hitting zone for so long, he's able to get enough of that and keep it on a line for a base hit. Good sign for Yachty and the Cardinals. So two men on with two outs for Colton Wong, who walked and scored his first time up. The only run of the game so far for the Cardinals. They're down 3-1 to one here in the bottom of the fourth. Pitch count climbing. That's number 70 for Buckholz as he's getting his work in. Along with 11 home runs, drove in 61 last year. Swings and lifts a fly ball pop up really in a very shallow left back at third is the shortstop Bogarts to make the catch and in the inning. All kinds of kids in the ballpark. When we come back, we'll take a look at kind of the role of kids in baseball. It's been a big story here in the last week.
Dan Schulman, Aaron Boone, Jessica Mendoza, Buster Olney with you here at Roger Dean Stadium. Spring training baseball on ESPN. Third pitcher of the afternoon for the Cardinals left-hander Tyler Lyons. His numbers from a year ago when he made eight starts, nine relief appearances for St. Louis. Had a big game, actually started and won the game when the Cardinals clinched the division last year. Seven shutout innings against Pittsburgh on September the 30th and a guy every year he's kind of knocking on the door with the Cardinals for regular work could be as a starter could be as a reliever but every year he also spends a little bit of time down in triple A. Yeah, I think if the season started today it would probably be the second lefty out of the pen along with Kevin Segrist but certainly brings that element of being able to start and part of that depth the Cardinals are trying to build. Or should someone go down at some point? Brock Holt leading it off for the Red Sox. Also, Matt Holliday's day has come to an end. Jeremy Hazelbaker in the minor league camp, number 91, is out in left field right now for St. Louis. And that's it for Holt. So we talked about. Uh, one of the big stories, I think the, it's probably been the most talked about story in baseball over the last week, the retirement of Adam LaRoche after he was told by the president of the White Sox, Kenny Williams, that he should bring his son, Drake, around less often. There is some dispute between player and president as to how often constituted less often. So for people who may not know, and if you're a baseball fan, it would be hard to believe that you don't know. This has been a huge story. Drake LaRoche, who's 14 years of age, had a locker in the White Sox clubhouse, was there every day. He's homeschooled. This was something that Adam LaRoche did in Washington. And when he went to Chicago, he said to the White Sox, this is part of who I am. This is part of my family situation. Are you good with this? And the White Sox reportedly said yes. Now, uh, about a week ago, Kenny Williams said, we got to cut it back a little bit. And, and this is where the dispute comes. How much? But half, maybe less. And Adam LaRoche... Put family first, I guess, and walked away from $13 million and retired. In the aftermath of that, a number of White Sox players, most notably Chris Sale, went off and went off on the, on Kenny Williams, saying they were lied to, and, and Chris Sale supporting his teammate. And everybody's got an angle and an interest and an opinion on this story. And Aaron, let me start with you as someone who grew up in a clubhouse to a certain extent. Your dad, Bob, caught for... Uh, over 20 years in the major league. So tell me what the experience was like for you and where you stand on this story. Well, one of the greatest blessings of my life was being able to grow up the way that I did in Major League Clubhouse, where my dad took me to work with him all the time. And from the time I was a baby growing up in the Phillies Clubhouse, I was always around. Brett and I shared a locker at Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia. We were in uniform, shagging. We had the run of the mill, and that was the case for most of my dad's career. Anthony Ramirez spanks one down the left field line, but foul. Broke but his bat as well. You also understood that each team was a little bit different in how they handled things and, and how they allowed kids. Um, you know, I was fortunate for the most part to be able to go to the ballpark with my dad. Um, but this is a this is a a lot of shades of gray to this story because obviously it's a big part of who Adam LaRoche is and a big part of him signing with the White Sox was this having this agreement in place. What I don't think is being talked about enough is I think the fact that Adam's 36 years old, coming off a difficult season, and having not really played this spring because of injury. I'm speculating, but I really believe that retirement was on the front of his mind anyway. And now all of a sudden you want him limited, limit his kid at the ballpark. I think it was the straw that broke the camel's back and pushed him over the head and said, okay, I'm going home then. Do you think Kenny Williams was within his rights to ask LaRoche to cut back on the amount of time his son was in the, in the clubhouse? In the field? Absolutely. The, the club... At the end of the day, you are the player, you are the employee, and you have to fall in line with what parameters and what the policies are that the team puts in place. Look, and it's your job to, to go along with that. So absolutely he has that right. You know, and I, I agree 
with that completely. I think it was a unique situation. And I think Adam LaRoche's family situation is unique. And I think it's special. I mean, he was homeschooling his child so that he could go to work with him every day. So there's so many players that talk about having their kids around and having that be a part of them being a pro baseball player. But I think in LaRoche's situation, this was pr one of the top priorities for him in choosing a team, being a part of the team, and honestly going to work every day, which is very unique to, to not have your child going to public school, private school every day, but rather being homeschooled so that he could be there every day. That's how important it was for the large family. Do you think this has a chance to leave a mark on the White Sox this year in terms of the kind of season they're capable of having? I mean, you now have their best player publicly ripping their president. That is not a common occurrence in professional sports. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's the storyline now heading into the season. So whatever happens in the first week, the first two weeks of the season, good or bad, it's going to be traced to this. Oh, they're playing terrible. There's yeah. fractions all over the clubhouse. And it has the potential, I think, to get very ugly. On the flip side, I think it could be a rallying cry. Like, you know, us against them, we're just going to play and kind of get in our little world. <laughs> And it kind of feels like Rick Hahn, the GM, and Robin Ventura, the manager, are kind of in no man's land between this situation. You know, with the Kenny Williams, the president. It, cer and some of the it other certainly does not feel very well thought out from man management standpoint in how they've handled this. Well, and Carl Ravitch had reported earlier in the week about Robin Ventura getting with his team because they were talking about boycotting one of their spring training games and the fact that that's how strongly they felt in defense of LaRoche but Ventura then getting his team together uh, it's been a big story it may remain one we'll have to see over the next uh, few days and weeks if this one just keeps going But as everybody knows, it'll be his last year in Major League Baseball. Better than 500 home runs for Big Poppy. And uh, all year long, you will see uh, features on David Ortiz. Here's a sample. Ready to roll? Let's do it. It's not all about being good physically. The mental part of the game, I think, is even more important. But you need to have your mind right to be able to play the, this game. And, and let me tell you, it's just, it's just not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. At some point, it kind of, it, it catch up with you. Have you thought about how you want to take it all in and remember it? Because the season can go by quickly. You know, I'm not planning on putting a lot of pressure on myself either. It's, it's not like whenever you go to a city for four days, it's not like they're going to have, be having a parade every, every day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I guess it's a one-day thing. They let you know ahead of the time. 
I'm going to show my appreciation to everyone. Um, and, and we're going to move on. And more on David Ortiz and his last season available now on ESPN.com. As mentioned, he's already surpassed 500 home runs, and if he has a good season, he's got a chance to pass some guys with some big resumes and big names. Football up the middle. Great diving stop. Throw to first. Got him. Manly Ramirez saluting Brock Holt for that play out at second base. Well, the Brock star flashing a little leather here with two weeks to go in the spring. This ball was rocketed and ticketed for center field. Look at a good break. A little hop up there. A little short hop on the... And the fact that he's able to get a ton on that throw is really impressive. Look how quick he gets to his feet. But there's a lot on that throw. I think he even caught Hanley Ramirez off guard initially going, oh, I got to hurry up and stretch here. Great play by Holt. Nice look by Jerko as he yeah. runs through. Like, are you kidding me? The guy who plays almost every position on the field plays him well, too. Here is Hazel Baker. We mentioned Jeremy Hazel Baker came into the game for Matt Holiday last half inning. His activity now in the Boston Pen, so Buckholtz is getting near the end of his afternoon. 78 pitches, as you can see. Pretty encouraging for the Red Sox. Uh, Clay Buckholtz has been very sharp today. We've seen all of his pitches creeping up on that 80 pitch mark, so seems in line to really be probably real close to being able to go 100 or north of 100 pitches when they break camp here to start the season in another couple weeks. I think what most teams, especially now, heading into the season, the last couple weeks of spring training, is you want to see command. And what I've liked from Buck Holtz okay. is his command of his fastball on the inside part of the plate to both sides, lefties and righties. We talked about his changeup, his ability to use his off speed, but I think him establishing right now, and that's what he struggled with his last outing. I love the pace that we've seen from him today. Pace has always been an issue for Clay Buckholz over the years, and it's been one of the emphasis that John Farrell has tried to have with him to kind of speed up that pace. And it really, I haven't even really noticed. Ground ball out to hold. And we'll get Hazel Baker by a step. Scott's MLB pitch hit and run is the official youth skills competition of Major League Baseball. It's free for boys and girls ages 7 to 14. Play your way to the national finals and have a chance to compete during All-Star Week in San Diego. Find a local competition in your area at pitchhitrun.com. MLB.tv Premium, everything you have come to expect and more. New low price for 2016. Watch every out-of-market game of all 30 teams live in true HD. Visit MLB.tv for details. Buckholz's afternoon is done. We'll be back to Jupiter after this.
four and two thirds today gives up just one earned run gets the pitch count up so a successful afternoon for the Red Sox right hander. You see Carl Willis there the pitching coach both he and John Farrell I think you could see Jess almost a little giddy like knowing yeah. that one of their guys they're relying heavily yes. on looked really sharp with two weeks remaining in spring training. And that's been the biggest thing with Eduardo Rodriguez going down is all right. And that was a guy they were counting on to slot that two spot. And there's been a, we mentioned it off the top, a lot of question marks, a lot of upside potential, and Clay Volkholtz is driving that upside bus if he's be able to get things together. Driving the upside, the upside bus. bus. I, like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. It'd be a fun bus to be on, right? A lot of music. Upside bus. Whoa, whoa. Who else is on? <laughs> Shaw, you on? Sandoval, you on? <laughs> Matt Barnes on the mound now for the Red Sox. The right hander went three and four with a 544 ERA and 32 appearances last year for Boston. <laughs> Fastball mid 90s, curveball and change, and a real, still in a battle and a real opportunity to make this team out of spring training. Probably talk more about it later on in the game, but the bullpen, much different looking bullpen. And they picked up Craig Kimbrell. They picked up one of the game's great closers and also a guy we're expecting to see today, maybe when he's on the mound, a good time to talk about the bullpen. Carson Smith picked up in a deal with Seattle, Wade Miley going the other way. Quietly one of the real dominant relief seasons a year ago. Lined into right field, a solid base hit for Piscotti. And this is why Piscotti. I mean, I feel like this last swing, this last hit is is Piscotti in so many ways. We've talked about his length. We've talked about his ability to stay in the zone. But this is why he's able to adapt to different pitches. And this is off his back leg. And granted, he's tall. He's got a lot of leverage. But this is just when you set up the tee and you're working on stuff, it's trying to hit pitches like that with the pop that he's getting. It's a beautiful swing. Is Jacob Wilson came on at third base last half inning for Matt Carpenter. His numbers last year, Triple A Memphis. Three one Boston leading bottom of the fifth on a windy day here in Jupiter, Florida. Runner is going and the pitch is hit in the air to left field. To end the inning. No runs a base and a man left. 3 1 Boston at the end of five.
and will broadcast a major league game from Cuba for the first time since 1999. The Rays will take on the Cuban national team in Havana at 1.30 Eastern Time and ESPN Deportes will provide the exclusive Spanish language telecast and the game will be streamed live via Watch ESPN. It's obviously a big deal given the changes in the relations between the two countries recently and Sandoval finds the ball in the center field for a base hit. One person with a keen interest in tomorrow's game is Brian Pena. He was one of the uh, the Cardinal catchers and is from Cuba and he is with Buster. And Brian, you defected from Cuba when you were 16 years old. So as you see this play out, President Barack Obama in Cuba, the softening of the relations, how does it make you feel? If, you know, it, it made me feel a lot better. I think uh, our people deserve better. You know, I think it's time for, for our people to, 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 to get a better life, you know, and uh, hopefully uh, everything's going to start to loosen it up and, uh, and things, uh, you know, I hope that the things will get better for, for, for my people down there in Cuba. And, uh, you know, it's, just, it's very exciting. It's very exciting for us to, 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 to be part of that, you know, back there in December when, when we flew down there. So hopefully we can continue to improve the relationships. You've seen the change in the rules regarding players coming from Cuba that you can now work out their deals directly with major league teams. How will that affect baseball in Cuba? I think it's going to make it better, you know, because the fact that uh, right now you're going to be playing for something, you know, right now the, the future really is going to be bright and uh, you're going to have the, the opportunity to, to play, you know, in the, in the best baseball on the world and that's, uh, that's become a, a professional baseball player and, uh, you know, just being able to, 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 to fight for something, just being able to, to pursue your dream, that gives you a lot of motivation, you know, down there and, uh, and, and you, you, you don't have to worry about uh, defecting or, or, or you know, have to worry about you know taking a raft or something or, or put your, your life in jeopardy and and for you to be able to, to go back to your country and enjoy your time with your family and uh, that that's 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 amazing you know that's something that it brings a lot of you know a, a, a lot of uh, you know joy to to all of us because uh it's been very tough it's been very tough for, for uh, you know a lot of the cuban players and uh you know hopefully things can change man you mentioned you were part of the Goodwill tour earlier during the off season. What was that like to you to see family members you hadn't seen in years? Oh, it was great. After 17 years going back to my country, you know, seeing my family, enjoying my time down there, you know, doing a lot of baseball clinics, you know, for for kids and and uh, you know, I, I had to thank MLBPA and, and Major League Baseball because they, they really put that together. And uh, and like you see, you know, that opens the door for for this trip now. You know, the Tampa uh, going down there and, and playing with the Cuban national uh, team, you know, is is. It, it, it was exciting, you know. It was amazing that um, you know I, I, we were part of that, and, and and me being Cuban, you know, is is is, is something that it, it made me feel like I did something good, you know. I did something good for for my people. I did something good for my country, and uh, hopefully, you know, it can continue to improve the relationship and uh, great things will happen for my people down there. Another member of that tour was Clayton Kershaw, and he touched you with his actions. Tell yes. me what Clayton Kershaw did on that trip. Yes, he did. I mean, all of those guys, you know, Nelson Cruz, uh, you know, uh, uh, Miguel Carrera, John Jay, and, and obviously, you know, uh, uh, Kershaw, he did he did something uh, amazing. You know, he stopped the bus, and then, you know, he got out of there and, and saw a lot of people, you know, down the street, and then he gathered, you know, down there with them, and, and uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, joking around and, and, and tell them stories, and, and then he was playing catch with little kids. It's, you know, down there, uh, uh, in, you know, in Cuba. And, uh, man, I, I, I knew that he was a special. You know, I knew, uh, you know, that he was a great pitcher. And, uh, you know, but the, the, the stuff that he did off the field, it really, you know, stole, stole my heart. And, uh, you know, I, I do anything for that guy because he really, he really did a great job, you know, for, for my people down there. And, obviously, you know, guys like, uh, you know, uh, Nelson Cruz and, and, uh, and Miguel Carrera, uh, they, they also did a great job. But, I mean, uh, Kershaw was a special, man. He really was special. Brian, thanks. Guys, back to you. Buster, Brian, thank you very much. That was great stuff. You know, and, and we spend 99.9% .9 of our time thinking about, well, will Cespedes play center or left? And man, Jose Abreu is great. And will Puig finally reach his potential? You know, and you think about Pena saying, you know, they won't have to come over on rafts anymore. And, and we're all aware of it, but we really, I get the feeling anyways, we don't really know very much about it at all. What some of these you know, young men from Cuba have gone through to try to get here, play baseball, make a better life for their family, and, and so on. And, and, you know, you can see the smile on, on Pena's face and hear in his voice how excited he is about the changes that may be coming. Well, 
you got to hear right there from one of the really good guys in Major League Baseball, and that's Brian Pena. As we look at Yasiel Puig and embrace Brian Pena there, working with some of the kids in that clinic, Jose Abreu. You see the emotion there on, on the on the Cubans' faces, getting to see these major leaguers. And, you know, hopefully, like Brian said, this is the start of something, and, and baseball can be that vehicle to to facilitate relationships. Did you ever play against Cuba in international oh. terms? Both of you did, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the more memorable baseball experiences was playing against Cuba, and that natural natural rivalry you had played on the junior national team coming out of high school. Off the glove of Wong into right field for a base hit, and the bases are loaded. And it was just that rivalry that Cuba was keenly aware of us and us of them. And, and I remember just being in, like, the eating halls or the rec halls, and, and the two teams kind of sizing each other up. There was always just this rivalry, sometimes not so friendly. Mm -hmm. But just, but certainly that respect factor there, one of the more memorable experiences of my playing days at any level. I remember actually my first year on the national team, we faced Cuba in the Pan American Games, and I, I went up against Jonas Cespedes' mom, who was a, <laughs> a lefty pitcher, and uh, she was in her 40s, I was like 21, and... Uh, <laughs> Oh, man, was she tough. First pitch she threw right at my ear. And that, to me, was something that just culturally, like, they had a way about them that, you know, she ended up, I think, striking me out with the changeup, like, away because she knew how to throw. And I was a lefty. I was crowding lefty on lefty. But just this fearlessness and the look in her eyes. I'm like, oh, she must have slipped. And me, oh, no, she looked right at me and was like, I'll throw it there again. <laughs> like, <laughs> little 21-year-old. And that's what's so cool playing internationally, but especially for Cuba. Um, and even getting to speak to you yesterday I was telling him that story and he was laughing because he's like yes that sounds about right that sounds my like mom. my mom yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny <laughs> bases loaded one out here in the sixth inning and Mookie Betts back up for the fourth time 0 for 3 Juan Gonzalez is the pitcher for St. Louis from Venezuela 25 years of age Having a little bit of a hard time getting the ball down. All these pitches that have been hurt, that have hurt him this inning. The first pitch of the inning to Sandoval up above the belt. A base hit by Bradley and Vasquez. Both pitches up. Yeah. And I feel like that's probably been the biggest difference between Buck Colts and what we've seen even from the Cardinals and the entire staff. Because yep. it, it, we haven't seen one of their main starters is that just the command and that control, that pinpoint precision, which you don't see a lot of in spring training. A lot more walks, a lot more deeper counts. And speaking of those starting pitchers, Jaime Garcia, starting pitcher, was supposed to pitch here for the Cardinals today, but ended up pitching on the backfields in one of the minor league games just so they could control his outing a little more. You're able to work on some things a little more. And Brian Pena actually caught him on those backfields today. So certainly a key member of the Cardinals rotation getting his work on the backfields today. Absolutely. Uh, Garcia was terrific once he got healthy last year. And if they could ever get 30 starts out of him, he's got great stuff. That St. Louis rotation still is awfully good. Combined for under a three ERA last year, and he brought up a great point. Everyone talks about losing Lackey, Lance Lynn going down, but he might, they didn't have last year. They get Mike Leak. I mean, expect for them to be right there, the top rotations in the country. Just no on the outside corner. Delayed call, but it's strike three. Betts strikes out two down. Here's a look at how the Cardinals rotation is lining up right now. Of course, the big horse Adam Wainwright is back. Michael Waka won 17 games last year. Mike Leak signs a big free agent deal. Jaime Garcia and Carlos Martinez, who 
was great last year, but then ran into some shoulder issues right at the end of the season. He stayed in Florida, stayed here near Jupiter, and worked out, strengthened all winter long, and his stuff is just great. And if he can take that next step, be that 200 inning guy, get through 32 starts, get through a season healthy, he could put up some major numbers. No doubt. And look, it's it's Leak and Wainwright essentially place, replacing Lynn and Lackey. And then there's still, as you talked about, still that upside with Carlos Martinez, still the upside with Michael Waka. A lot of potential there for the Cardinals this year. The Red Sox leave them loaded. As Gonzalez battles his way out of it. Live by Red Sox manager John Farrell momentarily as the Red Sox uh, finished in last place in the American League East last year, 78 and 84. Made some big additions, though, most notably David Price and Craig Kimbrell. We talked about some of the questions earlier involving Hanley Ramirez and Pablo Sandoval. And there are some high hopes for the Red Sox this year. Let's bring in John Farrell. And, John, first of all, great to see you back. Great to see you healthy. Everybody very excited to have you back. How are you feeling about camp so far? You know, Dan, uh, things are going well so far. We, we've got, obviously, some decisions to make. Uh, but uh, love the way they've gone about their work, uh, the, the energy that we brought to, to the ballpark each and every day. So we've had a productive camp, and uh, nearly 80 pitches of work for Clay today was a step in the right direction with his overall command. But uh, we've got some obvious decisions, and that's a third base and how we divvy up the at-bats out in left field. Well, speaking of those decisions, Travis Shaw making it pretty tough. He had a couple of other hits today and looked so strong through the spring, strong last year. What role do you see him playing early on this season? Well, I, I think it's been uh, pretty widely known in our in our camp, and particularly of late, that we've got a competition at third base between he and Pablo Sandoval. And uh, I think the one thing that is healthy in our camp is, is the competition. And uh, whether that's for the five spot because of Eddie Rodriguez's situation or certainly at third base, uh, it brings out the best in all of us. What have you seen, John, so far from Travis? defensively at third base obviously more of a first baseman throughout his career well at, at the pro ball level yeah he's played primarily first base but a guy that played college uh, you know at, at third base in college uh, you know Aaron he's played the position with some ease there's a pretty good internal clock depending on the speed of the of the given runner I think he's shown above average range particularly to the glove side and uh, you know a guy that just kind of goes about his work and he, he's he, he's a fierce competitor. Uh, you know, he, he came out early in camp, and he actually came over to me and said, hey, I made some comments that my goal is to be in the opening day lineup. He goes, am I out of line? I said, heck no, you're not. So it's, uh, like I said, it's a healthy competition, but uh, he's adapted well to third base. You, you touched a little bit on Eduardo Rodriguez. We heard maybe some good news. What can you tell us about where he's at in his process? You know, a bullpen today back in Fort Myers, 30-pitch pen. Uh, he'll throw another bullpen on Wednesday, but... Uh, his availability to start throwing live BP, which should be somewhere closer to the weekend. And uh, we just want to be sure that, uh, you know, his delivery is sound before we start to ramp up any kind of intensity. But uh, he looks like he's going to need a full spring training. So that takes a little bit of time. Uh, but at the same token, his foundation is, is getting on track. Well, getting on track, too, and uh, watching Clay Buckholz today in his outing. What did you like from him, and what do you want to see from him moving forward? You know, Jessica, more, just more the strike-throwing ability. Today was uh, a percentage of strikes more in line with what Clay has uh, typically given us over the past few years. He's healthy. He's strong. Uh, and I thought he had a pretty good feel for secondary pitches here today. John, thanks very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you during the season. Okay, Dan. Talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. John Farrell back is manager of the Boston Red Sox after stepping away uh, from the team and dealing with some health issues last year and has a clean, clean bill of health back now Dave Dombrowski the president of the Red Sox took over in August of last year it's going to be an interesting team going to be a very interesting division that they're in and the Toronto Blue Jays the defending division champs uh, the Yankees like the Red Sox you can look at the Yankees and say, well, if this, this, and this goes right, they could be a really, really good team, but those are some pretty big ifs. The Blue Jays appear to be, again, an offensive juggernaut like they were last year. People looking at the rotation and wondering, you know, how good that would be. And, uh, I know you all got the email recently that our picks have to start coming <laughs> out. And, and, I mean, you think about the American League East, and it is just, man, you can make a case for everyone, it feels like. At this point, and I, and I think that's what's what's exciting about it too, is especially in the American League, all the parity that exists 
currently in this game. I know I asked you, I think it was over lunch yesterday about your picks. You broke into a cold sweat. I mean, you didn't, it was the quietest I've heard you in the 10 years that I've known you. Yeah. yeah. So the Blue Jays, the defending champs, they've got a couple of contract issues that are really a dominating conversation involving Bautista and Encarnacion on the field. Things going well for the Blue Jays in the spring. The Yankees with Chapman and Miller and Batances. You know, how will the older players do? Uh, they got some big years last year to guys like Teixeira and A-Rod. Will they be able to get that again in 2016? Baltimore did re-sign Chris Davis. That's a big one. Richick with the ground ball down to third. And he's retired two down. What about Tampa Bay? I mean, the, the rotation has a chance to be outstanding. The kind of the annual question, I guess, is will they hit enough? But they did pick up some guys to try to bolster the offense. Yeah, I mean, it's potentially the best rotation in the division. I mean, especially with Chris Archer anchoring it, you don't think of a lot of aces necessarily in the American League East. Obviously, David Price now coming back to, to the division, but Chris Archer certainly could be that. Uh, Matt Morris coming back and healthy. So they're definitely not a team that you can just write off. There's all kinds of questions for all these teams, but man, I don't know. <laughs> well, and I like, I like a stars emerging too i mean marcus stroman is a guy that you talk about an ace that you might not know today and yeah everyone talks about david price leaving and going to the Sox. and i think stroman's the guy not necessarily to fill the shoes of price but to establish himself as a true ace when everyone's talking about the other side of the ball and how much offense this team has and here's a guy who just a great story a great leader being at Blue Jays camp, watching him pushing around his brother during a weightlifting yeah. exercise and just doing all the little things and prepared to take on the pressure that comes with being number one. I'll tell you one thing I know about the American League East this year. If you want to win, you better get a lead early because there are some bullpens now with, uh, you touched on the Yankees, but with the Red Sox have now brought in with Smith and Kimbrell adding to the mix. The, the Baltimore Orioles bullpen with Zach Britt, Britt anchoring it has been dominant over the years so you know with the Blue Jays bringing in Drew Storn and if Aaron Sanchez remains in the bullpen they have potentially dynamic mix back there so it, it's a bullpen rich division in the East this year you know one big difference between the leagues we talked about it when we we're talking about the National League a little bit before you've got some teams in the National League although nobody you know, no team president announces, hey, we're rebuilding this year. you got some teams rebuilding in the National League. I don't know that you can say that at all about any team in the American League. Everybody's trying to compete. It feels like eight of the 15 teams in the National League are genuinely com competing for those five playoff spots. The others do feel like they're in full-fledged rebuild mode in the American League. Maybe with the exception of the Oakland A's, it feels like you could make a case for just about every team. And that being said, I bet you the A's are a little better than we all think. Yeah, <laughs> and the Mariners and the Angels. I mean, I think the AL West, to me, when you look at that division, it seems like it's just the Astros and the Rangers. Adams drives one to right field. Gets there in the corner to make the catch. And the inning is over. 3-1 Red Sox at the end of six.
course he's in the right spot. Yeah, Thor meets the rock. We also like Chris Archer at number 31, also, of course, a friend of the show. Dan, back out to you. Definitely, Adnan, a friend of the program, as we saw and heard last year during the playoffs. Jonathan Broxton is in to pitch now for St. Louis, and Xander Bogarts grounds out on the first pitch of the inning. Broxton is going to be a, a key guy in that bullpen again. He was with Milwaukee last year, then was picked up by the Cardinals and pitched better for the Cardinals the last two months than he did for the Brewers earlier in the year. He can still throw hard. He can still strike people out. And, and you know, one of the things I was eager to talk to Broxton, who's obviously been around, has had a lot of success as a reliever. And I ask this a lot of times of veteran pitchers who have been around when they go to the Cardinals. And I want to know... Just how good back there and what kind of impact does Yadier Molina have? And he stops me in, in my tracks, which happens a lot, and said, he's unbelievable. He goes, I've heard about it, and I had no idea just how good he is at almost just inside my brain, thinking what I'm thinking. I've had these conversations over the years with Kyle Loesch. It's just like, man, he knows me better than myself. He just knows the league, knows hitters, knows what pitches to put down, knows what fingers to put down like no one else in the game. And it's just one of those huge impacts that Yadier has. And Jonathan Broxton felt that immediately when he got to St. Louis last year. So there you can see he's won eight consecutive gold gloves. Five years ago, Major League Baseball added a new award called a platinum glove, which is for the just one defender in each league, one player in each league, the overall best defensive player. And Molina has won the platinum glove for the last five years as the best defender in the National League. Well, and, and nobody in a Cardinal uniform would argue with that. And there's so many parts to catching. And I mean, not that every defensive position is simple and there's only one thing, although I would argue there are some that may be simpler, like third base. But <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. But I think, you know, the receiving, I mean, the, the ability, and you hit it, though. Number one is being able to get into the side of the psyche of a pitcher, understand what they need to throw, but also just the nuances of being able to be behind the plate, frame up a pitch, throw out a runner. Um, then you got the whole offensive side that comes along with it that I think a lot of times most people want to see that more than the most important stuff. And, and in a game now, it's a nasty slider there to get Ramirez, but in a game now where we measure so many things and, and we were able to quantify so many things, a lot of the things we talk about with Yadier Molina are totally subjective, but I think everyone acknowledges just the tremendous impact he has had year after year after year with this team. What does your dad think of him? You ever talk to your dad about him? Oh, yeah. He what loves him. I, I mean, and, and maybe I'm acutely aware of it because I grew up with a defensive-minded catcher. Right. You know, and so I knew how important that relationship was with pitcher, catcher, putting fingers down, receiving, throwing, all these things. So I've always been mindful of it, and, of course, he's – you know, a huge fan of somebody having the impact that Yadier Molina does. Going oh, to the count on Travis Shaw, having another good day, two for three with a single and a double. I like John Farrell. We spoke to him earlier, just coming out and saying it. Hey, it's a direct competition. If he gets another hit down the line, looking for two. But this is. <laughs> We've seen it all. I mean, you talk about spraying the field. Yep. I mean, his first hit, he gets up the middle, he drives a double down the right field, not flying down another double. You can't get more sprayed than what Travis Shaw shows. Yeah. I mean, that's a backdoor slider right there. That's just, I mean, great plate coverage and just rocketed down that left field line. That kind of little modified shift against him. As he creeps up on that 500 mark here in spring, you want, now you want to start saving some of those hits. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think Buster was making the point earlier that, you know, Dave Dombrowski didn't sign Sandy. Dave Dombrowski didn't sign Handy Ramirez. This is also a team that's finished last two years in a row and has, I believe, the third highest payroll in baseball. So Dombrowski's not wedded to the contracts that preceded him, but he does inherit a team and a fan base that. I mean, they're ready to, to have a winning season. Now, they won the World Series three years ago, but two consecutive last place finishes. And John Farrell has said repeatedly they're going to put the guys on the field from day one that give them the best chance to win. And he's Sandoval, well, one of those guys. And you think even in John Farrell's case, you know, he's 
there's a lot of questions about even his job security. So it's imperative that, you know, there's no easing into the season for John Farrell. It's going to be who gives us the best chance to win today. Because, like you said, two very disappointing seasons for the Red Sox the last two years. On the outside edge, one and two. Two down, runner at second, 3 1. The Red Sox lead here in the top of the seven. Another foul. Broxton figures in in the bullpen for the Cardinals. Uh, Jordan Walden is so He's good. The shoulder's fine, and he'll get some key innings in front of Trevor Rosenthal. Broxton will as well. They've got Seth Manus, the ground ball machine from the right side. Kevin Segrist, of course, from the left side. It's a Segrist, who really had one of the real good setup seasons yeah. last year in Major League Baseball. Diving effort out there by a minor league player, Magnuri Sierra. He can't come up with it. Sandoval's out at second as a run scores on the play. Well, Pablo Sandoval locked in that battle with Travis Shaw. Shaw with a few hits today. Pablo now with his second hit here of the afternoon. A base on balls to go with it. A good battle here between these two veteran players. Looked like a little slider down. He just that good plate coverage that we know Sandoval has. Just dumps it out there in center field to drive in a run. And now we'll put an end to his his afternoon. Almost now in running at second. The center fielder, by the way, for the Cardinals, who made the, the diving effort there, is Sierra. He's a teenager. <laughs> He's 19 from the Dominican Republic. And that's an example of a teenager that's a minor leaguer trying to make a statement. When you get a read on that hit, Sandoval got it on the hand, so he you can tell as a center field, you got the best view of the park, so you can see that all the way. You know off the bat, I, I'm not going to catch this. You pull up, you have a chance to maybe throw out shot at home, but when you want to make a statement, you go all out, even when you might not have a shot. Castillo late on it. And they're starting to sub a lot on you. How are you doing over there? Scorecard's a debacle. <laughs> <laughs> See, Here's the difference. You're handling things well. Thank so you. Here, here's the difference. I, I struggle through it. You're, you're done. You gave up. There's nothing past the fifth inning on your card. I can see it from here. You just cashed in your chips. It's not true. Yeah. 98's in center. 99's in right. Sierra will get another opportunity. And the inning is over. Seventh inning stretch. Red Sox up 4-1. to one. We'll hear from Hanley Ramirez when we come back.
Baseball on ESPN presented by Head and Shoulders. Dan Schulman, Jessica Mendoza, Aaron Boone, and Buster Only with Hanley Ramirez. Hanley, as we come down the stretch here, how's your swing feeling? It feels good. You know, working from now on is gone. You know, the, we're getting close to the, to the opening date and uh, just working on that strike sign and stay short. So much focus on you making the transition to first base this spring. How do you like it? I love it. You know, working with Butter. It's been unbelievable, great time, you know, we're going out there every day early and, uh, you know, try to get every little things. Last year you made the transition out to left field, this year you're making the transition to first. How would you compare the two? I mean, you know, I'm more familiar with the, with the infield, you know, and that's what I love to play it. And, uh, you know, I got a chance now to be back and, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to do the, the best I can. What's the thing you're most at ease with in playing first base and what's the thing that's the biggest challenge? Uh, I mean, so far, so good. You know, Border, I mean, he, he covered everything. So we, we work on those little things before it happens. So when, the, when that happened in the game, we, we, we got it. Hanley, thanks. Back to you guys. All right, Buster, thank you. By the way, Butter, for those who don't know, is Brian Butterfield, the third base coach and infield instructor for the Red Sox, and also one of Aaron's first and I think most popular impersonations. <laughs> Yes. Back when you were just doing it as a hobby, not making a living. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, Brian <laughs> Butterfield, one of the real good infield coaches in Major League Baseball, been around a long time, been worn a lot of different hats in the American League East, and uh, has, has been played a big role in helping Hanley so far make what looks like is going to be a good transition over to first base. Well, just how comfortable he looks, and I think that was probably the biggest thing I noticed last year when he transitioned to left field, and I think people take for granted when you're a shortstop and you move to another position, whether it be the outfield or across the diamond at first, the, the angles, uh, the reads, um, but really at the end of the day, just the comfort. And when I watch him at first base, he just he looks like he's enjoying himself. It looks like the infield is a spot that he just relaxes in, and he never looked that way to me last year in left field. And frankly, Jess, I thought he was going to, I thought he would struggle with it. But seeing him today and hearing the things I'm hearing from, from people that I really trust, I, I think it's absolutely going to work and he will be fine. So you look at him react to a rocket off the bat earlier of Brandon Moss. Not a good sign here, though. Something wrong with Carson Smith is he's going to come out of the game. So the Red Sox will make a pitching change, and as they do, we'll go right back down to Buster's. Got Mookie Betts. And Mookie, as we wait and see uh, what's going on there, uh, early this spring I had a conversation with David Ortiz, who just raved about you, and he said you've already become a leader on this team, and he talked about one night you got everyone to go out to dinner. Tell me about how that took place. Um, you know, just I was there's a lot of new faces in the in the clubhouse, and you know, having that being that I had a year, I figured I might as well try and put something together, um, you know, and try and make it an annual tradition. What kind of response did you get from the other players? Uh, I mean, everybody was pretty positive about it. Um, you know, I think we had I had all but maybe four show up, so uh, it, it was a lot of people there, and I think we really enjoyed it. Now, early last season, you were struggling a little bit, and you dug yourself out. When I talked with Chili Davis, other people on the team, they always talk about how you ask questions. How did you work through that and finish so strongly? Uh, it was tough. It, it was not easy at all. Um, but, you know, I was, I was able to find a way to trust myself. And, you know, I mean, I figured there was no way, nowhere but up, you know, from, from where I was. And, um, you know, asking a lot of questions and, and it helped me to uh, stay out of it. And, um, We'll stay out of it for so long, and now I just want to use that this season as well. Give me some examples of input that you got from different people on the team. Um, you know, David's always been like, trust yourself. Um, you know, really, he always says, watch the game and see how guys are pitching. And, and, and you know, Hanley, Hanley always is, is really just big on trusting my hands and whatnot and just see the ball and hit it. Now, you might be the only active major leaguer to have thrown perfect games in bowling, right? You're telling me before you have seven. I asked you in the offseason, you had four during the most recent offseason. Why do you like uh, using bowling in the offseason? Um, it's just something I do. It's something, something I do to get away from baseball for a little while, um, you know, because we did this so long. Um, you know, use it as my uh, rest period. Um, you know, bowling's not too active. But, uh, um, I know I need to uh, challenge Brandon Phillips. I know he called me out, so I need to uh, get on the lanes with him at some point. For those who don't know, explain your connection with bowling. Um, it started when I was probably about three. Uh, I think uh, my mom wouldn't 
she uh, she said the day before I was born, uh, she was at the bowling alley bowling, and um, you know after that, you know, she, her and my dad would bring my uh, playpen into the bowling alley. So, um, you know, when I was about three, I started rolling, and, and um, you know I've been rolling ever since. Okay, thanks. Back to you. You started rolling. Rolling. <laughs> That's great. Um, he's a terrific player. But you star. Can see, yeah, star in the making. And you can see what an important part of the of the team he is, how he's learning from the older players, the work ethic, and how he's starting to pass some of that on himself. Um, this guy's got a bright, bright future. He's competitive. He asks questions. I mean, I think that's so important. We talked about this earlier, but you got a guy, two guys like Dustin Pedroia, David Ortiz, you see the new pitcher, Robbie Ross Jr., but then you have the Mickey Betts and the Xander Bogarts and these younger guys. It's a, it's a beautiful mix right now for the Red Sox. It's only going to be there for a little bit longer. So the fact that he looks to these older guys is important. So Carson Smith leaves with a, a at this point to us at least an undisclosed injury. Robbie Ross is on the left-hander. Let's go back down to Buster. He's got Travis Shaw. And Travis, three hits today. What do you think's been going well for you this spring? I feel really calm at the plate. Um, obviously, once you once you have success early, that confidence level grows, kind of settle into a little bit of a groove. And I've been getting pretty regular at bats, so it's kind of allowed me to get into this kind of groove I'm in. And just like I said, there's two there's two weeks left of camp, so just trying to finish strong. Your effort to be a starting player is getting a lot of attention this spring. How are you handling that competition? It's fun. I mean. I want nothing but the best for all my teammates, but obviously, individually, we all want to we all want to play well individually, and whatever I can do to help this team, I will do. Um, I kind of came into camp looking to push for a little bit more, so, um, but whatever role that that becomes on it, uh, opening day, I'll, I'll be more than willing to fill it. John Farrell told us a little while ago that you went to him early in spring training and mentioned that you'd made comments about trying to win that job and you wanted to make sure those were okay. Give us your side of that conversation. Uh, I just don't, I didn't want to step on anybody's toes. I mean, I told a couple of people in the media that my job or my my goal coming in was not only make this team but push for a starting role. So, um, and I did say that early. So I just wanted to make sure that I kind of wasn't out of line and didn't want to step on anybody's toes because obviously you don't want any controversy or any drama to come up this early in the season. How did David Ortiz help you at the end of last season? He was huge for me. I mean, he gave me advice on kind of how he did things and uh, being able to hit behind him for about a month and a half. He, when there'd be pitching changes, he just kind of gave me an idea of how they attacked him, pitchers attacked him, and all this stuff that he would look for at the plate. And he gave me pointers on kind of what to do, and most of the time he was spot on. Travis, you're mostly known as a first baseman, but you have an extensive history at third base. Explain that. Yeah, I mean, I was drafted as a third baseman, kind of got pushed off that position. There were a couple of higher prospects than me going through the system. Um, but last year in the minor leagues, I kind of got back over there finally. And um, I thought I played pretty well last year, and it's kind of carried over into the spring. It was something I was focused on this offseason to prove I could play third base because I thought that would make me a little bit more valuable, and it's, it's worked out. Travis, thanks. Back to you guys. All right, Buster, thank you. Having a big, big spring. And interesting, you know, somebody asks you a question, you say, yeah, I'm pushing for a starting job. And, and that's how he should feel. Now, whether he felt he should say it is another story, but he you know, tried to make sure everything was okay with the other guys on the team. But, boy, he's he's pushing for some regular at-bats with the Boston Red Sox. There's no doubt about that. And my first look at him in person over at third base today, he's handled a few balls flawlessly, started a double play ball back in the first inning. And Got both mitts. Yeah, continues to make his case, and eventually we could even see him log some innings in the outfield this spring. Come on, keep coming. Come on. Well, and think about how difficult that is. I mean, first of all, he's got two gloves just for the infield, right? First base, third base. Then he's got his outfield glove and left. And you're also working different angles, and and he's trying to solidify by himself getting at bats, getting plate appearances, and these are three completely different positions. And yeah, guys do it. It's not like he's the only one, but he's doing it successfully, and I think that can't get overlooked as well. So Robbie Ross Jr. into the game for Boston. Carson Smith left with an injury. It's a, a new look bullpen in a couple of respects. They went out and picked up one of the great closers in the game, and Craig Kimbrell. They still have Koji Uehara and Junichi Tazawa. They bring in Smith, who last year in 70 innings struck out 92 and only allowed 49 hits. Ross and Lane, although not everything's a done deal at this point, these are just possibilities or speculation with a couple of weeks left in spring training. 
Well, hopefully the Carson Smith situation isn't too bad for the Red Sox because, I mean, he is a critical part of what the Red Sox are trying to build with that bullpen down there. Coming off again, a tremendous season for the Seattle Mariners, one of the premier relievers in the game last year in a setup role this year, but not a good sign when you have the trainer take you off the mound after a few pitches. When you brought up, well, we talked, we had a conversation about the AL East and bullpens and the Yankees and all the attention that Chapman with Batances and Miller and that setup of 7, 8, 9, possibly. But I, I think a lot of people, the reason why the Red Sox have gotten so much attention besides David Price is because of him right there. Not just Craig Kim, well, not just getting David Price, but Carson Smith being that setup guy, which is now the trend. Of we're seeing a lot of teams wanting to go. Who's the guy that's going to come in the seventh and the eighth? Sometimes it isn't the ninth that you need somebody. 0 oh and 2 the count on Greg Garcia. He's been a utility infielder and a good pinch hitter for St. Louis, but Ross makes quick work of him here for out number two. Thursday, we're heading to Arizona. Got more spring training baseball coming your way. The Cubs will take on the Giants in Scottsdale at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. The game will also be streaming live on Watch ESPN and the ESPN app. And again, at this point, we are under the impression it will be Jake Arrieta and perhaps Madison Bumgarner starting that game. You think about Arrieta and what he was able to do the second half of last season. and got a chance to, to talk to him and <laughs> do some workouts with him. Yeah, how's Crazy your Pilates, Pilates <laughs> right? Oh, my gosh. I mean, you're talking, like, what he can do with his body, and I think it makes so much sense with the type, the, the mechanics that he uses to throw. Um, the fact that he's not just strong. I think a lot of times kids, grown men, uh, people think to be strong, you just go and you pound squats and you get heavy weights and for Arietta it's a combination of that and the flexibility that's why he's able to have that sort of crossfire movement he does with his body with a ton of success you see some of that video on Thursday there's a base hit for Jeremy Hazelbaker and as you saw has never played a regular season game in the major leagues he was a fourth round pick by the Red Sox back in 2009. He's also been in the Dodger and now the Cardinal systems has uh, played a number of years at Triple-A. Still a little bit of break from to the big leagues. Now Carlos Piguero will get his first at bat of the game. Piguero's a guy who does have some major league experience. He has been a Mariner, a Royal, a Ranger, and very briefly a member of the Red Sox. He's had a pretty good spring so far for the for the Cardinals. Couple home runs, hitting around 400 this spring. He's a big person. He's about 6'5", 260. He's had some huge power years in the minors. I like that. He's a He's a big person. He's a big person. <laughs> let me just, let me just <laughs> tell yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> if he's walking down the hallway and I'm walking towards him and it's a narrow hallway, I give him. He gets, <laughs> he gets to go by. <laughs> and he's a big person with a big swing. <laughs> I think it's probably one of the hardest things to translate in baseball is, is having a bigger body to be able to use that as leverage into power. You look at him and you're thinking, this is a 30, 35 home run guy, but it's not that simple. When you talk about having to get so many parts moving in the same direction. Hey. Hey. That's probably one of my favorite things about baseball is you can get a guy Pedroia size, you can get a guy Figueroa size. I mean, they're it's not NBA, NFL, where you got to be a certain build. I mean, you can do it. He went around, and the inning is over. Seven in the books here in Jupiter. The Red Sox lead four to one.
Talking Baseball on ESPN is presented by Head and Shoulders. Live head first. Back in Jupiter, top of the eighth inning. Dan Schulman, Aaron Boone, Jessica Mendoza, Buster Olney, the Red Sox, and the Cardinals. 4 1 Boston leads. And this is Jordan Walden, who missed most of last season with a shoulder issue, did not require surgery, but he pitched in the first month, pitched brilliantly, as you can see from those limited numbers in the first month of the season, but that was it. Never was able to come back. And again, if healthy, a key component of what figures to be a very good bullpen for St. Louis. Dow had a 32 save season for the Angels back in 2011. Josh Rutledge, the former Rocky, is the batter. And a base hit through the left side. Well, Walden with that power stuff, fastball slider change. At times, to get up in that high 90s range. I think he's even touched 100 at times. But a very funky delivery. Uh, that pause in his delivery kind of jumps at you a little bit. Oh, Rob Nen esque. Would that unsettle you in the batter's box a little bit? The hop? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's a it's a different look. It's not something you see. So it's one of those things that can certainly throw off your timing, especially when you're facing him one time late in the ball game, and all of a sudden maybe it takes you a couple pitches just to kind of find that that timing, that rhythm. And it's and it's a lower half too, yeah. and it's it's in a funky way, which I guess every windup has its own uniqueness. But a lot of times when you get a pause, usually it's with the arm. It's usually something in the upper half. But for him, it's that front leg, that extra kick that that can throw you, especially your timing. ball in for a strike and it's one and two. Something that's always a telltale sign of spring training is the fact that throughout the entire game a lot of these guys taking first pitches you're not going to see a lot of aggressiveness early in counts. It's a lot of just like let me see especially as you get into the relievers. Devin Marrero's not having any fun. It's Walden. Strikes him out. Let's go down to Buster. Guys, I spoke with John Farrell, the Red Sox manager, about Carson Smith's departure from the game, and he said what he was experiencing was cramping in his forearm. He said it was not a case of feeling a grab on one particular pitch. It was just something that had developed during the course of that at bat. Uh, and so we'll see. I, I can tell you this. You were talking about the importance of Carson Smith. When the time the Red Sox traded for him, I got texts from executives other teams saying, what a great trade by the Red Sox because they feel like he's such a unique weapon with that strikeout ability plus the ability to get ground balls. So this will be something important to watch for the Red Sox. All right, Buster, thank you very much. The Red Sox hoping that it is the the best case scenario that it is just cramping. <laughs> Last year the numbers were not very good for the Boston bullpen and so tough to win in today's game without having a quality bullpen. So the Red Sox, Dave Dombrowski and company, and John Farrell have hoped that they have remedied that situation with the acquisitions of Kimbrell and Smith. And that's why I like the Red Sox. I mean, this season, I like to, I mean, they'd get my pick for AL East because Whoa, they could hit. your hand early. Yeah, I, I'm not afraid to jump in. I'm going to shiver. What did you say he was doing? He was sweating cold. Behind. Okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> But for me, I mean, honestly, this team could hit last year. They just they went and picked up the two most important things and areas that they need, and they did in a big way their starting pitching and their bullpen. 
and Jess, that's sometimes what can happen in a lost season where things get away. It get, creates opportunities, especially for young players that can establish themselves as part of a core moving forward. Runner going, and the base hit through the right side. In all likelihood, would have been a double play ball. If the runner's not on the move, instead it's a base hit, first and third. And we saw that last year with Mookie Betts obviously breaking out. But Jackie Bradley Jr. got another opportunity at the big league level and seized on it. So now looks like a part of the future going forward. A number of other guys, the same kind of situation. Travis Shaw got an opportunity that he otherwise wouldn't have had. Yeah. And now all of a sudden they're part of what could be a very good team. Big parts. Yeah. I'll tell you what I like. If you look at the Red Sox schedule for the first two weeks of the season, seven of their first 14 games are against the Blue Jays. Conceivably, those could be two teams who go. battle it out for the division title. You never know. As you said, anybody, it's a wide-open division. It's a very strong division. So Dan wants to put his pick in after those first I don't weeks, pick them. Right? No, the play-by-play -play guy doesn't pick them. The play-by-play -play guy says to the analyst, so what do you think? That's my job. So what do you think? Do Nobody cares you, what I think. Do I call you play-by-play -play guy now? Yeah. Play-by-play yeah. -play guy. Uh, have to. I'll tell you what will be interesting, though, is, is uh, David Price will start one of those games in Toronto uh, on the first, yes. second week of the season. Safe at second. And, and that'll be a scene when you know, Price was only there for two months but was absolutely beloved. Yeah. And uh, that'll be quite a scene when he goes and, and uh, starts in Toronto for his second start of the season. Well, and of course, you know, you want to see Toronto throughout the entire season. I mean, even Price said at the end of the season when he was pitching in that atmosphere, he said there is no better atmosphere in all of baseball in my career than pitching right here in Toronto. And that, I mean, I almost fell out of my seat. Like, yeah. I, I wasn't there, and I, I could then imagine what that city, what that country it was uh, must get behind. we were there it's pr it's pretty loud <laughs> it was pretty loud in October it was pretty loud in September too. yeah and loud's one thing yeah. but the passion and and the and the way the Blue Jay fever just overtook that city was remarkable shot foul at the plate but it was the Red Sox the Blue Jays did not extend an offer to price uh, a number of teams did the Red Sox got him seven years two hundred and seventeen million dollars and here's what they got one of the best in the game eighteen and five last year between Detroit and Toronto he led the American League in ERA and he was the runner up for the Cy Young Award in the American League to Dallas Keuchel. And I, I think he's a perfect fit for Boston. I, I, I mean, obviously, you get an ace pitcher. It's a, it, it's a great thing. But typically, you won't see a Red Sox, the Red Sox as an organization, go hard after a left-handed ace, being that their ballpark favors right-handed power. So you don't necessarily typically want a lefty throwing to those right handers. But David Price is a reverse split guy, and he tends to dominate right-handed hitters Whereas lefties see the ball better and hit the ball better, and therefore I think lefties against him in Fenway Park have a diff more difficult time hitting for power. Swing and a miss, and Danny Mars strikes out. Let's go down to Buster. And as that process of bidding for David Price began, I got a phone call from one general manager. He said, you know what's going to happen, right? The Red Sox are just going to crush everybody, and it's not even going to be close because they want Price that much. And it's not only the pitcher they're getting. Brad Ausmus, who managed the Tigers, told me that among all the starting pitchers he's ever been around, David Price was the best teammate, the guy invested in other players on the days when he wasn't starting. Ground ball down to third. Buster, thank you. Across the diamond to end the inning, and we're heading to the bottom of the eighth here in Jupiter.
ESPN Fantasy Baseball is back, and it's free. Go to ESPN.com slash Fantasy Baseball or download the brand-new app to sign up today. Bottom of the eighth inning here in Jupiter. With Jessica Mendoza, Aaron Boone, Buster Olney. I'm Dan Schulman. We've got the Red Sox and the Cardinals for you. Jacob Wilson is the batter. Robbie Ross Jr. is still on the mound for the Red Sox. Yes, I got to say, it's a real joy watching Dan Schulman <laughs> scramble through his notes at this time of I, the game. I'll tell you, between the wind Where's the snoop can? and all the changes, <laughs> I'm, I don't often earn my money, but I'm earning it. Today. Is this, is this <laughs> how he treats you all the time? It, it's, no, it gets you know, He enjoys Sometimes enjoys over you. there shuffling <laughs> through notes, and yeah. after a few seconds, I see the frustration Yeah, he settling. knows that look. And, and yeah. then the light bulb goes off like, yeah. oh, I found it. Yeah. <laughs> Me, meanwhile, as you sit over there doing a whole lot of not much. <laughs> I'm glad I can yeah. sit between. Well, there's a reason. <laughs> oh, this, is not, this is not an accident. <laughs> this is not an accident. How many weeks? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's get this back on the rails. Heading into 2016, a number of significant players could reach significant milestones. This one is amazing to me. Ichiro could get to 3,000, considering how many years he spent professionally in Japan. A-Rod may get to 700 home runs. Bet you a lot of people didn't know that one. A-Rod at 386 saves and Chasher and Beltran both with a chance to reach 400 homers. To me, of all of those, the Ichiro one is by far the most interesting. Uh, I think and he maybe the most difficult. Yeah. To get 65. Oh, the 3,000 or the fact that he needs 65 to get to 3,000? The fact getting that 65 this year. Yeah. I mean, because conceivably that's going to take, you know, oh, well over 200 at bats yeah. probably, which... Yeah. If the Marlins are healthy, those at bats may not be there. Ooh, near collision in the outfield. Well, the wind of spring training in Florida is ball blowing all over the place. And see the left fielder there screaming all the way. That center fielder never quite was comfortable enough just to call it. Well, when you say the left fielder, you mean Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call you out. I mean, if you're, if you can't do that. You, know? <laughs> you started. Yeah, you, fair, fair enough. So well, that's what's interesting. Yeah. Go ahead, you go. Never had a brother. He's the little brother I never wanted. <laughs> but I got him now for 26 weeks. Uh. <laughs> I'm sorry, you were going to make a point. <laughs> So, see, we got, I was going to talk about the yeah. game, but go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. No, we're done. We're done. I put him in timeout. It's your turn. <laughs> it's it's kind of irrelevant now. I was going to talk about the wind. It's so boring. But it, it was applicable yeah. about a couple minutes ago. All right. that fly let, ball. Let's talk about this guy. This is Sierra. This is the kid who was in center field, a 19 year old from the Dominican, um, Dominican Republic. In 2014. He was named the, the minor league player of the year in the Cardinal system. This is a guy, this is a big time prospect for them. Good point. And these are important at bats, you know. I mean, you're, you're coming up from the minor league side, you're, you're getting an opportunity to play in these games in front, of, in, front of, in front of a full crowd. You're facing a guy that's going to be in a major league bullpen, lefty on lefty. These are critical in the development. Getting an idea and seeing how guys handle certain situations go a long way in, in, in playing a role in the development of these young quality players. Do you remember, not your first at bat in the big leagues, your first at bat as a minor leaguer getting an invite to play in a major league game in spring training? You yes. That? Yeah. yeah, it was in uh, Winter Haven. Eric Plunk. Oh. Not a fun at bat no. for a right hander. No, no, not at all. First swing I took, I almost fell down. Next swing, I broke my bat and popped up in foul territory for an out. <laughs> welcome, welcome yeah, to Big right, League right, Spring right. Training, right. son. So kind of a push. <laughs> I touched it. <laughs> and you're looking.
looking for Sports Nation. It is currently airing, just beginning to air, right about this moment on ESPN News. We are here in Jupiter, Florida, bringing you some spring training action. The Red Sox leading the Cardinals 4 to 1 as St. Louis bats in the bottom of the eighth inning. Franklin Jacobs at the plate, waving at that pitch from Ross. All right, come on. Swing and a miss to end the inning. Eight complete here in Jupiter. The Red Sox lead the Cardinals four to one. Juan O oh, from Korea, the last two years pitching professionally no. in Japan. Prior to that, nine years in Korea, 357 saves in his 11 years in Korea and Japan. You talk about cool nicknames. I mean, this guy wins the award. He's got two of them the Final Boss and Stone Buddha. Uh, they're both great. Yeah, they're both great. He is the final boss. I'm going to see him combine a fast fastball, low 90s with a nice hard slider. But it goes to quite a bit, and that's always an adjustment coming, whether it's from Korea or Japan. Seeing Kenta Maeda adjust with that with the Dodgers is how often you throw your fastball utilizing an off-speed pitch because 91-92 definitely doesn't blow it by any hitter here. So not relying a lot of times on, on stuff you used to rely on overseas. And right on the outside edge for strike three call. Well, he's got that delivery that is very common that you see in Korea and Japan. That kind of hesitation. And here you see even more deception with that little tap as he lands. He doesn't plant. He gets off of that, and it turns into like a double tap, which I think adds to some of the deception. And that fastball that he just threw, basically at the knees, 
probably has the illusion that it's a little harder than it actually is. Buster has more. Yeah, and you guys remember, of course, Jordan Walden's unusual delivery. Well, he told me. Dan? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, he told me that O oh, and he had been playing catch, and they spent some time imitating each other. He said O oh, is a great guy. He's he, trying to learn as much English as possible. He's constantly asking questions in English, but they seem to have developed some sort of rapport over the fact that they have two weird deliveries, let's face it. <laughs> and going back to back, how about this Red Sox lineup that gets to be like, great, sweet. Now we get another guy that's got a funky little tap, especially when spring training is all about timing. I mean, it doesn't matter even if you're throwing perfect. It's still hard to time up and even a regular guy. There's a crispness to that fastball right there. That's 91 miles an hour, but you can just see there's some late finish to it. And O figures to play a prominent role in this bullpen this season. He just had himself a quick inning. Three up, three down they go. We're going to the bottom of the ninth. Red Sox up 4-1. Day. The Red Sox leading the Cardinals 4-1 as we go to the bottom of the ninth inning. A reminder, tomorrow um, you will see the Tampa Bay Rays and the Cuban national team. President Obama expected to be in attendance, 1.30 Eastern time here on ESPN. Thursday, we'll be back with you from Scottsdale, Arizona. We'll have the Cubs and Giants for you at 7 o'clock Eastern time, 4 o'clock Arizona time. <coughs> Plus, you'll get the Cardinals and the Mets Friday afternoon, and then Monday, the Orioles and the Red Sox. Opening day is less than two weeks away. It's a week from Sunday, with three games being played on that Sunday, all of them on ESPN. The Cardinals at Pittsburgh, the Blue Jays, and the Rays, and then the Mets and the Royals. James Callahan into pitch now. Right-hander spent last year at single A. Greenville, seven and six with a 4.53 ERA. The batter is Paul DeJean. So if you're the Red Sox today, what you take out of this game probably is Clay Buckholtz taking a positive step, getting deeper into the game, pitching well. Uh, it did not go as well for Marco Gonzalez. Kind of a fill-in start with Jaime Garcia getting his work in. In a controlled environment on a backfield, something that seems to happen more and more often in spring training these days. It's the president of the Red Sox, Dave Dombrowski. Well, and, and, and if you're the Red Sox, making sure Carson Smith, yeah. or hoping that Carson Smith's early departure isn't something that turns into a serious issue. 
another good day for Travis Shaw. Travis Shaw, the, the competition at third base continues to heat up with Shaw was tremendous, handled everything defensively, hit his way, swung the bat good again. Pablo Sandoval DHing today, had a couple of hits and on base three times, so he certainly, you know, doing his part to, I guess, hang on to that starting role. Yeah, you know, I think underlying we didn't get into too much, but Rosny Castillo, as you see the strikeout, pretty quiet today as well. And that's another the tripod of the positions that Shaw can play that is pushing other players that have big contracts and are expected to do big things. And if not, I mean, Shaw's got a chance of that left field, left field spot too. I mean, if the, if the bat plays, they'll find a spot for you, right? Yeah. They'll, they'll figure it out. Here is Mike Ullman batting now for the Cardinals. With 273 with a dozen home runs last year at Double A Springfield. Also for the Cardinals, Yadier Molina got his first hit of the spring. Working his way back to health. The thumb evidently good enough, obviously, that they're letting him swing the bat now. And, you know, I think exciting for them. Looks like he's now in line to be full bore on opening day, which certainly appeared to be in question at the start of spring training and something the Cardinals, I think, were prepared to be without him at the start. But great sign for the Cardinals. So that'll actually be the the first game that's played this year is St. Louis in Pittsburgh. I think it's one o'clock on the Sunday on April the fourth. That'll be a good atmosphere. That'll be a, that's a great way to kick the season. Up. April the third. Forgive me. April the third is Sunday. Monday's April the fourth. Just outside. Let's go down to Buster again. So, guys, I want to see if you agree with me on this in terms of baseball rivalries. We know what the Steelers and the Ravens are in the NFL. That, to me, is the Cubs and the Cardinals this year. And then you have the Steelers and the Bengals. That's the Cardinals and the Pirates. What do you think? Absolutely. Uh, yes, I think it's number one right now. Based on just how great of a rivalry Cardinals-Cubs is anyway, and considering some lean years of late for the Cubs until last year, and now you take it up another level with both teams being outstanding, both teams playing against each other in the postseason, and now really the Cardinals, who's been that model, consistent franchise, and the Cubs kind of getting all the hype though right now. Yeah, there's going to be some battles between these two. In the first few months, I mean, you, it can't be said enough that you had two of the stronger players for this Cardinals team, John Lackey and Jason Hayward, that are now on the other side. That, you know, four or five months in, they'll get over it. It's not a big deal. But in the beginning, the fans are not going to be over that. There's going to be a lot of emotion. I love that in that division, really, nobody likes each other at all. Like, you know, some of us lament that there's more fraternizing in baseball than there used to be. But in that division, you know, when, I mean, the Reds are at a different place now than they were a couple of years ago. But the Reds and Cardinals, they don't like each other. Reds and Pirates, Reds. Pirates and, yeah. When, when Anthony Rizzo went over to the dugout, that was against the Reds. That yep. was a Cubs and Reds. I mean, that's, that's kind of an old school division where there's no love lost between the teams. There's one and not in time. First, safely across on the field is choice. And the Brewers last year always seemed to have the Pirates number. Like, even when the Pirates were on a, a good run, the Brewers were always that team that you just didn't expect to be that strong. And the two down here in the bottom of the ninth with the Red Sox leading the Cardinals four to one. Hazel Baker is back up. The base hit his last time up. Playing behind the runner, and he'll take second. Again, reminding you about the uh, game tomorrow from Havana. 
the Tampa Bay Rays against the Cuban national team with the president expected to be in attendance. 130 Eastern time right here on ESPN. One up above the belt, three and two. Shot with the Cardinals down to their final strike in the bottom of the ninth makes it a one run game. Well, Hazel Baker now with his second hit in consecutive at bats, a rocket for a base hit in his last at bat, and there gets a 3 2 count. A little late on the fastball up on the previous pitch, but certainly went to work on the timing. And he gets a ball down in the strike zone in the heart of the plate. And you could tell from that swing, he knew right away he got a good piece of it with that wind blowing. Blows it out over our TV trucks out there in right center field. And that cardinal greeting once you go deep. And the Red Sox are going to make a pitching change. So we'll step aside for a moment, come back and set the new pitcher for you here with two down in the bottom of the ninth of the Red Sox lead down to one. Ninth inning, Hazel Baker with a home run to make it 4 3 with two down at the bottom of the ninth. And Robert Pointer is the new pitcher for the Red Sox, left hander from uh, just down the road from where we are here, West Palm Beach, Florida. Spent last year at short season, short A Lowell, where he went 1 and 2 with a 228 ERA. 
He was a 13th round pick, 14th round pick, excuse me, in the draft last year. So short season. Aaron is often for guys who have just been drafted. It's not a full season. It's kind of a June to August kind of thing, right? For guys who are just entering professional baseball. Yeah, and he had a nice little debut for himself. 23 and two thirds inning, struck out 22 batters and walked just two. And right, right out of the shoot here, he shows off that command. Two quick strikes to Piguero. Took something off and he bounced it in for ball one. He played in the College World Series twice as a member of the Florida Gators. Just missed. That's a great pitch in that count. Piguero showing some big swings we've seen from his two at bats so far and throw that off speed moving away from him. Just got it clipped the plate, he would have had him. Wow. <laughs> Jammed him and it's fouled back. I wouldn't be surprised. He comes back with that off speed away. Up and in with the fastball. John Farrell's got a right hander up in case Piguero reaches. Did he check? He did. And it's a full count. Look from the side here. It definitely looks like he does hold that swing. Aguero was a little frustrated. He got called out on a check swing his last time. That time definitely strong enough to keep those hands back. And now it's over. So Pointer gets the last out, gets the save. The Red Sox beat the Cardinals four to three here in Jupiter. As both teams move a step closer towards opening day. Sports Center is coming up next here on ESPN. Hope you enjoy the telecast today. Always great to be down in Florida and doing some spring training baseball. Great crowd in the house, a lot of regular.